Hey everybody, today we're debating Trinity versus Tawheed, and we are starting right now with Jake, Muslim Metaphysician's opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us, Jake. The floor is all yours. All right. Are you able to see my screen there? Yes. Okay. Ready. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, everyone. So, the debate before us tonight is the Orthodox Trinity versus Ethity Creed. To be clear, this is a debate over polytheism and the belief in three gods on the one hand, and monotheism, or the belief in one god, on the other hand. In the first half of my opening statement, I will explain and offer a defense of Ethity Creed. In the second half of my statement, I will explain what the Orthodox concept of the Trinity is and offer arguments against this position. First and foremost, unlike Orthodox Christians, we Muslims believe in one God. Say, He Allah is one, Allah, the eternal, the self sufficient. He neither begets nor is He begotten, nor is there to Him any equivalent. Allah is one God, does not rely on anything other than Himself, and everything in creation relies upon Him. He does not be beget nor is He begotten or cause to exist, and there is nothing equal to him. The great Ethity scholar Ibn Khuzayma summarizes Ethity Creed saying, and I quote, Our doctrine, or medheb, as well as that of all of our teachers, is as follows. We ascribe to God everything that he ascribes to himself. We acknowledge it verbally and hold it to be true through inner conviction within ourselves, though without thereby comparing God's face to the face of any creature or created entity, for our Lord is above being like unto creatures. So, we affirm real attributes for Allah based on the apparent meaning of the text and ascribe to him what he ascribes to himself. We know the meaning of his attributes, but we do not know the haqiqa or the kafiyah or the precise reality of the attributes. Keep in mind that when we say we affirm the apparent meaning of the text, this takes into account the surrounding context of the verses mentioned as well as the entire corpus of revelation. We do not deny his attributes, nor do we liken his attributes to the creation. We reject divine simplicity or the notion that God does not have any real distinct attributes. However, his attributes are inseparable from his essence. He is not composed or caused to exist by something outside of himself. We also affirm that Allah is an active, dynamic creator that is genuinely capable of acting in succession. He creates different things at different times and speaks to his creation whenever he wills by his will and power. We believe his actions can have a beginning in time and yet are uncreated. The legendary scholar of Hadith, Imam al-Bukhari, states, and I quote, Fufi'lullahi sifatullahi wal maf'ulu ghayruhum min al-halqi. So, Allah's action is his attribute, and that which is acted upon is distinct from him, being part of his creation. He also says, his occurrences, exalted be he, are not similar to the occurrences of creatures. According to the saying of Allah Most High, Laysa kamithli he shay, there is nothing like him, and he is the hearing, the seeing. Lastly, Al-Bukhari states that Allah's command, which has a beginning in time, is uncreated. So as we can see, Al-Bukhari affirms that Allah's actions are his attributes, and they are distinct from creation. His actions also can have a beginning in time, and yet they are uncreated. Some may argue that we ethities affirm that Allah has a hand and thereby liken him to creation. They may claim that we cannot attribute the same name to God and creation without ascri ascribing the same ontology for God and creation. This principle is falsified if one affirms God and humans can possess an essence without being similar ontologically. The same bears true for every other predicate given to God. Also, looming behind the charge of tashbih is an assumed realism regarding universals. For example, God and humans both have knowledge. This universal knowledge must be partially identical in God and man, the objector assumes. However, if we reject the realist notion this argument assumes, we cannot affirm the conclusion of tashbih. There is no ontological sharing between God and creation because ontological sharing does not exist. Every object, including its essence and attributes, is particular and not universal. Universals merely exist as concepts in the mind. 
The claim that ethity traditionalists represent an overtly anthropomorphic theology has been refuted countless times, and most recently by Fareed Suleiman when he states, and I quote, Wesley Williams attempted in a 2002 article to show that Ibn Hanbal's conception of God was blatantly anthropomorphic, an untenable claim in my opinion, close quote. Suleiman also cites numerous other academics who have refuted this falsehood and goes into more detail substantiating his claim. We, we should also keep in mind that J and the Eastern Orthodox have no problem with Tashbih. In fact, they consider it necessary, given their concept of theosis, described by Maximus the Confessor as, and I quote, a sure warrant for looking forward with hope to deification of human nature is provided by the incarnation of God, which makes God, him, God, which makes man God to the same degree as God himself became man. Let us become the image of the whole one God, bearing nothing earthly in ourselves, so that we may consort with God and become gods, receiving from God our existence as gods, close quote. So as we can see, Orthodox Christians do not have a problem likening God to creation or creation to God. I now turn to my opponent's theology of the Trinity. I will argue that Jay believes in three gods, based on what is known in the literature as the logical problem of the Trinity. To put it simply, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each God, but are distinct from one another. The normal method by which we would count would mean that they are three gods. Eastern Orthodox scholar Bo Branson states, and I quote, the doctrine of the Trinity is central to mainstream Christianity, but insofar as it posits three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are one God, it appears as inconsistent as the claim that one plus one plus one equals one. So the common so-called Muslim meme of one plus one plus one is right on target. I expect Jay to attempt to reply to this argument, but as we will see later, his responses will not help him and will only create further difficulties. My second argument is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit cannot be one God because they do not possess the same power and knowledge. Orthodox Christians claim the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God because they possess the same energies. However, power and knowledge are energies and they do not possess the same power and knowledge. For any power or knowledge that they do not share, they make an exception to this so-called rule in an unprincipled manner. For example, the Father alone has the power or ability to produce or cause another divine person to exist. According to Jay, the Father alone causes the Son and Spirit. They cannot have the same power if one divine person has a power that the other two lack. Therefore, they cannot be the same God if they do not have the same power. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit also do not have the same knowledge. The Father alone knows that he has the power to cause the Son and Spirit to exist. The Son alone knows, from a first-person perspective, that he is the Word who became flesh, was born, and died on the cross. Therefore, they cannot have the same knowledge. If they do not have the same knowledge, then they must be three gods, according to Jay's own standards. My third argument is called the epistemological schizophrenia of orthodoxy. Jay and the so-called orthobros make a transcendental argument claiming that orthodox theology is a necessary precondition for knowledge, logic, argumentation, etc. What exactly is the argument or justification for this claim? Now here's where the epistemological schizophrenia of orthodoxy comes into focus. Jay's good friend Ananias Sorum states, and I quote, Obtaining the necessary conditions for the possibility of knowledge cannot be logically or epistemically contingent uh, upon logical or epistemological arguments, since this would result in question begging and amount to epistemic bootstrapping. Neither would the veracity of the claim that such and such conditions are necessary for the possibility of knowledge. The necessary conditions that would provide justification for our knowledge must be both metaphysically and epistemically prior to epistemology and arguments, close quote. It seems the response to that is that there is no argument or justification for the claim that orthodox theology is the necessary precondition. However, in the same article, Ananias Sorum contradicts himself, stating, and I quote, therefore, the only condition that will satisfy the possibility of knowledge and bridge the gulf between man and truth is the unique idea of God coherently articulated in the theology of the Eastern Orthodox Church, who has preserved the correct doctrine of God 
received in divine revelation from the Holy Trinity. For only in the orthodox doctrine of God will we see that God, the necessary condition, is rational, omniscient, transcendent, non-contingent or necessary, intentional in his creation, as opposed to creation being accidental, a personal and communal being having per perichoresis within his trinity, close quote. And he continues on listing all of the reasons why the Eastern Orthodox Church alone can serve as the necessary precondition. He contradicts himself again, just a few sentences later saying, and I quote, in presupposing God as the necessary condition for the possibility of knowledge, man surrenders his autonomy to the revelation of God, not as a conclusion that has met the standards of his epistemological criterion itself, close quote. So which one is it? Does Jay and, and have an argument and justification for the claim that orthodox theology is the necessary precondition for knowledge and argumentation? And if so, then what exactly is the argument? If not, then the claim is equivalent to stating that a banana is the necessary precondition for knowledge and argumentation. And when you ask me to justify that, I can simply say that you are missing the whole point, as this argument is beyond justification. Let's see which direction Jay goes and if he can remove himself from this state of epistemic schizophrenia. My final argument is what I call the problem of orthodoxy in orthodoxy. By this, I mean that early church fathers and saints in Jay's tradition rejected the doctrine of the Trinity. Jay denies this and claims that not only were the early church fathers Trinitarians, but so were ancient Jews. He cites authors like Alan Siegel, Daniel Boyoran, and others to support his claim. However, he does so either out of complete ignorance or does so dishonestly. These scholars simply point out that there were intra-Jewish theological disputes regarding how one should interpret certain texts. Some Jews interpreted passages in the Old Testament in support of a theology similar to, similar to Logos theology, where the Logos is a divine or semi-divine figure that serves as an intermediary between the Most High God and creation. Boyoran quotes Daniel Abrams saying, and I quote, No one view dominated the spectrum of Jewish interpretations, since the biblical text is the only common frame for the wide variety of speculations, close quote. So Logos theology was not the only view or even the dominant view in early Judaism. Also, these same sources Jay loves to quote represent Justin Martyr as a proponent of Logos theology and not Trinitarianism. Boyoran again states, and I quote, many of these passages served as the origin and proof text for Logos theology as manifested in Justin Martyr's dialogue on nearly every page, close quote. Alan Siegel states, and I quote, both Christianity and Gnosticism arose out of Hellenistic and apocalyptic Judaism by sharing heretical traditions of scripture interpretation, which speculated on a principal angelic mediator of God, close quote. This is exactly what I've always claimed. Lastly, Boyoran acknowledges the stark difference between Logos theology and Trinitarianism saying, and I quote, Nicene Orthodoxy also effectively crucifies the Logos, while not ceasing to, be, to speak of the Logos in the move to a Trinitarian theology within, within which the entire Trinity is both self-contained and fully transcendent, Athanasius and his fellows insist that God alone, without a mediator, without an angel, without a Logos, is the creator. Logos theology is ultimately as thoroughly rejected within Nicene Christianity as within Orthodox Rabbinism, close quote. So, Logos theology, so, so some Jews were Logos theorists and others were not. However, none of them were Trinitarians. Also, some early Christians were Logos theorists and some were not. Justin Martyr and other church fathers were Logos theorists, but Logos theory is deemed heretical by Orthodox Trinitarians. Jay and his Orthodox friends pray to dead saints who held heretical positions and did not believe Jesus was the most high God. It seems like orthodoxy has a problem with orthodoxy. In conclusion, ethity creed is the belief in one God who is the creator of all. As for Jay and the orthodox Christians who suffer from epistemic schizophrenia, I argue that they believe in three gods. The Father, Son, and, the Father, Son, and Spirit do not have the same power or knowledge, rendering them three gods. And lastly, they have a problem with orthodoxy as their early church fathers held to a heretical theology by their own standards.
Thank you very much, and I look forward to Jay's presentation. Thank you very much for that opening. And folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, want to let you know we're thrilled to have you here. We hope you feel welcome. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button as we have many debates coming up. You don't want to miss them, so hit subscribe right now. We're going to kick it over to Jay for his opening as well. Thanks for being with us, Jay. The floor is all yours for your opening statement. All right, can we see the screen? Yes. All right, let's get into it. So I, uh, I'm i glad for Jake there basically doing everything I wanted him to do in his opening statement. So he's handed me a lot of gems, and it's going to jive perfectly with what I put in my opening statement as to exactly where I knew he would go. So let's talk about Salafi Islamic absurdity. And that's, of course, the position that Jake represents here. And uh, we're going to look first at how one of his representative theologians that he said represents the Palamas of Islam, Ibn Tamiyyah, particularly in his book on the oneness of God, <clears throat> we're going to note that it's a massive Christian fail. And we're going to see the similar fails that Ibn Tamiyyah makes in understanding Christian theology basics that Jake himself made when it came to the triad, by example, for example, by reducing the idea of begetting to being an energy. Begetting is not an energy. So for Jake's argument to hold that he made earlier about the triad, begetting would have to be a common energy, and it's not. <clears throat> First of all, Ibn Tamiyyah posits at the outset of his book, an eternal world uh, existing eternally separate from God based on an infinite regress of worlds. Now, Jake has made many critiques of this view and others, so it'd be interesting to see if he rejects a basic idea in one of his basic Palamas-like theologians of the Islamic tradition. Second is uh, Ibn Tamiya posits the Trinity as contradicting natural reason. This is a problem they're going to notice uh, later on in uh, Ibn Tamiya, as well as Jake, given that he doesn't understand the transcendental argument, as he made clear in his opening statement. That's going to be very relevant for where we go here in a minute. Arguing that the Trinity makes energies and attributes persons is a move that Ibn Tamiya makes, which is false. He attributes to us the Nestorian view of Christ as two hypostases, which is false. And he attributes to us an Arian modalist view of the Trinity collapsing person and nature and God on pages 22 to 24. Now, uh, he may not believe those things, and you may not believe those things, but that's not our position as Orthodox. So if we're going to be arguing against the Orthodox position, you can't set up a straw man and say that you're knocking down the uh, Orthodox position when it's the Arian or Nestorian position. Thus, Ibn Tamiya uh, and, and Islam in general fail to understand, typically speaking, the Orthodox <laughs> Trinitarian dogma, <clears throat> and they create a straw man as a formula, uh, as formulated in our councils, which reject Arianism and Nestorianism. This would be like me basically calling Jake a Sufi and then proceeding to refute that position. Jake's failed account of unity and multiplicity in Allah. This has come up uh, in a few debates now with Jake. But what is being debated here between us is not actually a pure Unitarian position of Jake versus the threeness position that I have, but rather two different ways of accounting for unity and distinction in God. Jake would like to give the impression that his position is free from all um, issues that relate to multiplicity. Uh, but in past debates, we will say that this fails. Jake believes that uh, the attributes of God are, according to Ibn Tamiya's two principles, really distinct amongst themselves from God's essence. What applies to one attribute also applies to all the others and equally to God's essence. This includes affirmation and negation, true whether we know the meaning or not, except the plain meaning, as Jake said in his opening statement. Attributes are comparable <coughs> to creatures in terms of perfections, which creatures partially have, while God maximally has this perfection in a way befitting him. Thus, likeness in these uh, cases is, quote, in name only, according to Ibn Tamiya. Ergo, it tells us nothing especially with Jake's uh, uh, nominalist empiricist position, which he admitted, we will look at this in a second. So keep that in mind. True for thee, not for me, the Jake brand. Jake believes that the attributes are really distinct and inseparable. Did you hear him say that in his opening statement? That means counting by division. But he also distinctly identifies a really dis uh, uh, the attributes as really distinct from each other and from the essence that's counting by identity, which in the same boat, places him in the same boat as Trinitarians when accounting for the distinction of hypostases, counted by identity, and the divine essence, counted by division. 
<clears throat> no, I did not say that Jake thinks that the Allah that Allah's attributes are persons or that we think attributes are persons. That is Jake's straw man that he often uses in many discussions and live streams when he attempts to rebut this argument. But rather, <clears throat> Jake makes the same move when accounting for unity and distinction in God that we do, yet he calls us out on it. This is, in fact, Jake's guilty double standard. Furthermore, Jake and Ibn Tamir are allowed to engage in affirmation claims about Allah, which we call cataphatic theology, that he would call idolatry in Christianity. Jake often states the Trinity incarnation is pagan. We will look at examples in a moment, but <clears throat> this illustrates another double standard where Allah's body parts are considered real, but not created. Foot, hand, eyes, etc. What is an uncreated foot that is nothing like a human foot? What, by the way, is a more perfect foot? Does the God foot have toenails? Isn't a foot with toenails more perfect than a toenail deficient foot? In other words, it tells us absolutely nothing and it reduces to absurdity. Also, Ibn Tamiya argues that God laughing is somehow more perfect than him not laughing. I'm interested to see how Jake accounts for this. It would then follow that eternally laughing is better than laughing once. So God is eternally lolling. In other words, a clown God. Remember, what applies to one attribute, according to Ibn Tamiya's rules, applies to all the others. If there's an infinite series of created worlds and causes, then why would we ever need a single being? Also a position of Ibn Tamiya. Contingent means dependent upon something else, but it's begging the question to say that it's a single necessary being. So Ibn Tamiya might cash this out or Jake in two different ways. <clears throat> if it's a causal relation, then he's engaged in the quantifier shift fallacy that every event has a cause. And so that every event has one cause. If every event is contingent, such that there's a transference to the whole, that's the parts whole fallacy, because if every being is contingent, therefore the whole is contingent is in non sequitur. For example, my room is made up of atoms, atoms are invisible, therefore my room is invisible. This is a non sequitur. And this relates to the two types of argumentation that Ibn Tamiya thinks is a rational argumentation for the existence of God. Created acts in God's essence. Jake is quick to claim idolatry in our position, but holds Actual idolatrous views by positing actions in the essence of God, <clears throat> unless he again departs from the guy that he says is his palamos. So in Suleiman 241, the Ibn Tamiya and the attributes of God, <clears throat> we have this pointed out that, in other words, temporal acts are contrasted with eternal acts. Jake makes this argument himself, and Jake may counter that created acts are now eternal. That is a contradiction. It also creates an attribute that contradicts Ibn Tamiya's principle number one of what is applied to one attribute then applies to all, meaning that all the attributes are now created and temporal or temporal acts are eternal. It also violates it in principle, uh, principle number two, which applies to the attributes in God's, uh, that which applies, which applies to the attributes applicable to God's essence, meaning that God's essence is now temporal. Idolatry, uh, we'll remind you, is ascribing to creatures of the divine nature or worshiping creatures as God. This may also be why Jake thinks God's knowledge is had through discursive propositions, and that's precisely why he thinks the indexicals argument in a debate <clears throat> from modern analytic philosophy applies to his ideas of God. I can simply reply that God's uh, mode of knowledge is not equivalent to creaturely modes of knowledge, and since Jake can at will invoke the idea of uh, we don't know the modality, well, we don't know the modality of God's knowledge. <clears throat> But I also might just simply deny that God's uh, knowledge is <clears throat> discursive or indexical. <clears throat> More problems for Jake, perfectly laughing. Do the attributes of Allah considered in themselves possess a seity? This has been uh, asked to Jake in the past. And of course, Jake has not had an answer to it. Is one answer, uh, one attribute considered in itself less perfect than all of them comp uh, compiled together? Or all of them plus the essence? Remember, <laughs> a lot of this theology is going to be built on perfect and less perfect metaphysical assumptions. And we're going to see in a moment that he doesn't even have the ability to get to uh, predicating metaphysical claims at all. Why is laughing and turning his face, quote, more perfect than not? And this is, it's actually argued by Ibn Tamiya in the book, the uh, Suleiman book. We might ask, what is a more perfect laugh? Was it a perfect laugh? Was it merely a snicker? Why must we arbitrarily stop and inquiring about this meaning? If it's a, they will typically say, well, it's a laugh that befits the majesty of Allah. This again tells us absolutely nothing. And in fact, it's circular because it's not telling us anything. It's just another supposed attribute that tells us that Allah is more perfect. So that's a circular claim, which even, even Ibn Tamiya re rejects circularity. 
<clears throat> if being is part of what it is, see, what it is to be perfect, then God must be seen to be perfect. Yet Ibn Tamiya says that God cannot be seen. Even Suleiman notes <clears throat> in the book uh, on Ibn Tamiya, page 252, this is a flat out contradiction. And again, we're going to see tons and tons of contradictions when it comes to basic ideas about predicating about God. What is the a priori uh, idea, by the way, of metaphysical uh, perfection here? Where does Jake derive it? How do we know this? Well, it turns out it gets even worse because Jake, Ibn Tamiya's epistemology, as he noted, is an empiricist nominalist epistemology. Jake's position cannot get off the ground in terms of predication at all. And if this argument holds, all of his argumentation about Tawhid will then fail. This is because Jake has put his metaphysical cart before his epistemic horse and is engaging in a host of unjustified, arbitrary, and contradictory claims. Empiricism is the view that knowledge arises from sense data or relations of ideas. Nominalism is the view that universals have no real existence. And for Ibn Tamiya and for Jake, they're purely mental and solely particular. A committed nominalist, however, must grapple with the following problems. There is no empirical perception of, quote, necessity, being, cause, or any other metaphysical claim. This then undercuts all of his theology and theology claims. There's no empirical perception of the peripatetic axiom, the idea that what's in the mind derives from sense data. This is a position that Ibn Tamiya holds. There's no empirical uh, perception of, quote, reason or, quote, self-evident truth. We note that uh, Ibn Tamiya affirms self-evident truths, as most uh, Sunni do as well. And I assume Jake does as well. There's no empirical perception of the universal that is abstracted by the intellect through the phantasm, something cribbed from Aristotle, also present uh, in Ibn Tamiya. The universal is thus not a universal if it's only merely particulars. I forgot to put the footnote there, but I can add it. There's no empirical perception uh, of, quote, perfection, meaning all the arguments that hinge Allah's perfection on maximally creature-like perfections also then fail. There's no empirical perception of identity over time. If you're an empiricist, these arguments uh, are arguing. And by extension, no perception then of meaning over time. In other words, I can just take Hume's critiques of identity over time and apply them to Jake's position, which is a not consistent empiricism. Uh, it turns out, actually, David Hume's empiricism is way more consistent, and that's why we, we can use these arguments. In fact, Jake might think this isn't fair, uh, since this is a debate about Talit and Trinity, but again, he brought up uh, transcendental argumentation, so I don't feel uh, unfair now. But <clears throat> if all this uh, about predicating about the attributes is based on a faulty epistemology of naive empiricism and a faulty metaphysic of nominalism, then every sentence Jake makes fails to be justifiable or even coherent, as all predication itself is now impossible, much less divine predication. <clears throat> Indeed, the Oxford Handbook of Islam even uh, notes that Ibn Tamiya is a Hume and a Locke before Hume and Locke. Thus, as such, he will be subjected to the exact same critiques that we make of Hume and Locke. Ibn Tamiya, principles of reason are self-evident. On page 196, we're told it's Ibn Tamiya's view, and I assume Jake's as well. It's a form of classical foundationalism where the first principles in terms of reasoning are self-evident. <clears throat> According to Ibn Tamiya, they require no justification. If this is the basis of his reasoning in general and by extension of the theological reasoning uh, of Quranic explanations, then we see no basis for this assertion. If Jake can be arbitrary, so can I. Jake, I can just claim that the uh, transcendental argument requires no justification. It just is the case. Now, I don't actually think that, and I'm going to address your misunderstanding of the category error that you made between uh, logical and metalogical argumentation, but that'll come later. <clears throat> what is the non-self-referential, non-circular basis for you as a kind of foundationalist for thinking that the principles of reasoning are self-evident? What determines self-evidence? If it's based on something else, else then it's no longer self-evident. If it's not based on something else, then there's the problem of arbitrariness. Furthermore, there's the criteria problem. What is the more fundamental principle by which you classify self-evidence from non-self-evident truth? Example, uh, for example, in, uh, IT admits many passages that are disputed in the Quran uh, in terms of their meaning, Yet, we're told that the plain, simple meaning is accessible to all and becomes extremely complex, however, when we see uh, Ibn Tamiya lay out four rules for knowing when it's figurative versus the plain meaning. Now, this, you can see, uh, was a huge source of dispute between him and Dr. Khalil in their debate, where they were trying to figure out between <clears throat> various Quranic texts, the pen, the tablet, this, that, the hand, the foot, what's literal, what's figurative, and... We, well, Jake says, look, we're going to go to the, the rules laid out by my scholars. How do we I mean, know that those rules are the correct rules? In other words, it's just moving the problem back a step. 
Given that Jake rejects the incarnation as a pagan contradiction, we can return to the body parts, which are clearly anthropomorphic. Attributes are claimed to have a practical teaching, a value that would be uh, useful for 7th century Arabs and Jews or even Christians hearing the text. <clears throat> Yet the plain meaning is championed by Ibn Tamiya and the Salafi. It's based on analogy or likeness that is immediately divested of all the meaning. Making the statements empty and contradictory, hand, foot, face, laughter above the throne, descent to the lowest heavens are all, quote, affirmed and then stated to be unknown in modality. In other words, the God foot is a foot that befits Allah, but it's nothing like a human foot. Even Suleiman notes uh, uh, of Ibn Tamiya that he plainly contradicts himself here on body parts on page 331, as well as on the notion of creaturely and divine perfections on page 252. It is a hand that's unlike empirically known hands, is basically what we're saying here. Yet we're expecting every uh, person in this century to just simply know that, well, clearly it's not talking about a creaturely hand, even though we are empiricists. And so lastly, I would note that the Trinity is a doctrine that is not far-fetched. Uh, Basil in letter 234 says the energies come down to us. And then monarchical Trinitarianism, which I think we'll get into, my time is running out, uh, is uh, a combination of... Uh, Counting by uh, by unity by division and identity. With that, I want to say first, thank you to both of our guests for those opening statements, folks. You can <coughs> find our guests link below. I encourage, even if you don't agree with them, this is a great opportunity. You can learn their positions firsthand by checking out their links in the description box. Also, want to let you know for tonight, we have a limited Q and A, as this debate is going to be a pretty long one. So, want to let you know. For the Q&A, we won't get to every single question. We do want to ask, one, if you do a Super Chat, we're going to read Super Chats that are $5 or more. And if you submit a question where it's not a Super Chat, just a standard question, we're going to try to get to those, but no promises because we do want to let these guys out by a decent time tonight. But with that, we're going to jump right into the rebuttals. Thank you very much for those openings, gentlemen. And Jake, the floor is all yours for your first 10-minute rebuttal. Okay, thank you very much. I just want to say at the outset, uh, you know, Jay's opening statement was very interesting. He spent the entire 15 minutes attempting to attack my position, which I'm going to show in just a second that he did a very poor job because he's so ignorant of our position. He doesn't understand what we actually believe. Nevertheless, he barely went through any detail during the 15 minutes of explaining what orthodox theology is and what that actually teaches. So the audience and myself, if I don't didn't have these, you know, about 50 books of orthodox theology, I wouldn't know what the hell Jay's position actually is because he didn't go into any significant detail to talk about his own position. Whereas I did, I tried to manage my time to speak about half the time about my own position and half the time about my opponents in, crit in critiquing his position. So I wish Jay would have spent more time on his own uh, position, but of, cor of course, as we'll see, it's very difficult to do so because he can't defend his own position. And I just want to point out that Jay makes so many mistakes about what he thinks Ibn Taymiyyah's position is, what he thinks ethity or Salafi, Aqidah, or creed is, and I'm going to try to point that out as we go along and when we get to cross-examination section, one by one. And I just want to explain this to the audience. It should really be of no surprise because Jay himself, and people were wondering, why did he delay this debate? Well, he delayed the debate because he told me that he was incapable of having the debate unless he was able to read one text that was an unreleased text in English. Okay, so this is a guy who just started reading about Ibn Taymiyyah and Ethity Creed two weeks ago, and he thinks he's now an expert and going to tell the audience all about it. It's, a, it's honestly a complete joke. Okay, so now let's get to some of what Jay actually had to say here. He says that Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't understand Orthodox Trinitarianism. Well, nobody would at this point because you didn't really explain it. But nevertheless, what Ibn Taymiyyah says about Orthodox Trinitarianism is irrelevant to this debate. I didn't cite Ibn Taymiyyah as an argument against Orthodox Trinitarianism. I gave arguments in which I've made numerous times, and you haven't responded to any of them, in which you should have been able to preempt in your opening statement because I've been repeating them for five plus years. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, Jay makes a big to-do about nominalism. Now, I actually appreciate that, Jay, and that's why I spent a significant portion of my time 
uh, speaking about our position of nominalism because I think it's a clear uh, difference between the two views. If nominalism is true, then Orthodox Trinitarianism is necessarily false. And I think even Jay Dyer would have to agree with this. Why? Because they conceive of the universal that the three persons share or the essence as a universal that the three persons share. Well, if there are no such things as imminent universals, then quite literally the Trinity cannot exist. Now, Jay makes it seem so obvious as if these things, such as universals, these entities, and, and, and so if people don't know what they are, right? You know, you can see this piece of paper here, this white piece of paper. The idea that Jay Dyer wants us to believe that he thinks is so obvious is that there is something. Can you picture it, people? There's something in this piece of paper that is actually identical to the white stripes and the whiteness in my color and my skin complexion. That's what Jay Dyer wants us to believe, is that there's this thing, there's this thing that's a universal whiteness, which exists that is partially at least identical in the paper and also in Jay's forehead. Well, if he thinks that that's so obvious, I'd like him to give an argument for that, because based upon Occam's razor, we should not be postulating entities beyond necessity. Jay Dyer has given no argument for the existence of these so-called Aristotelian imminent universals. And this is going to be a big difference between us going up. So I at least appreciate Jay uh, having enough sense to know and understand that. Now he makes a big to-do about nominalist predication. I don't know if Jay has done any reading on nominalism. I assume that he has with all those books behind him. But I'd like him to show me an argument from an actually scholarly source that says that nominalist predication is meaningless. That unless there is this weird thing, which is a universal, that is partially identical in this white piece of paper and in Jay's beautiful forehead over there, unless there is something partially identical in them, it makes no sense to say that Jay's forehead is white and this paper is white. Now, does the public and the people watching think that that's a convincing argument? No, Jay needs to give an argument for his position. He has not given any argument for his position. So until he can give an argument for the necessity of these types of universals, we can simply dismiss it. Now, um, that ties into everything that he was saying about uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he's mocking about God having so-called body parts. Well, if he's actually read the Farid Suleiman source that he desperately needed to delay the debate in order to, uh, to read that, he would actually see that Farid Suleiman explicitly says, as I quoted in my opening statement, that the idea that Ibn Taymiyyah's conception of God is overtly anthropomorphic is completely untenable. And he cites numerous sources and gives arguments for that throughout the book. So Jay can say he disagrees with that, and it's fine. But on the one hand, you can't claim that Jake and the Ethari saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a hand is completely meaningless. And on the other hand, say that it's Teshbi or it's likening God to creation and having body parts. So you cannot have it both ways, Jay. Is the nominalist predication completely meaningless and devoid of any content? Or is it meaningful and therefore we're likening God to creation? And if you do think we're likening God to creation, then what is your problem with that? Because you believe in the necessity of likening God to creation and your concept of theosis, which I quoted from St. Maximus the Confessor in my opening statement. So even if, let's say for the sake of argument, oh my God, this is terrible anthropomorphic, Jake is likening God to creation. Okay, what is your problem with that? You can't, you don't have an argument about that. You have no argument about that whatsoever. So uh, Jay needs to deal with those points. He mentions about uh, indexicals and God's knowledge. Um, well, actually, before I get to this, there was another important point here. Um, let me see. There's so much nonsense he, he mentioned. He said, you know, he said there, even Jake believes in two ways of counting. He believes in accounting by identity, and then he also believes in counting by division when it comes to Allah. And he said, you see, he mentioned that Allah's attributes are inseparable from each other. I mean, honestly, Jay, 
where did you get this from? This was the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard that we're counting by division. No, in fact, by the fact that they're inseparable from one another and inseparable from the essence means that we are counting them by identity. Because if we were counting them by division, then we would say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only has one attribute. But we say that he has many attributes and yet they are not divided by time and space. So how do we say that there are many attributes and yet they're not divided by time and space or, in, or separable? Because we're counting them by identity. Wow, I don't know how you made such a big blunder there. So you need to show how I'm counting by uh, division or separability when it comes to attributes or the essence. That was One a minute big left. blunder. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. The, the, the next part here where Jay mentioned about the in indexicals. I want to read a quote from one of his um, authors that he appeals to. Uh, let me just bring it up here. Okay, so on indexicals, he says, well, Jake has a strange understanding of God's knowledge. Well, that's, let's see if that's the case when it comes to these indexicals or the I. Well, I'm going to show you in a source here from Jay's own people that that is exactly the case, if I can ever find a damn quote. <laughs> Let me see here. Okay. Um, Got about 15 seconds. Okay, I'll get to that quote in my uh, next rebuttal, but I'll show you that Jay's own church writers explicitly use the indexical eye in appealing to God's knowledge. With that, we'll kick it over to Jay for his 10-minute rebuttal as well. If you haven't yet, folks, hit that like button. Not for me, but for you, so that YouTube knows what to serve you more of. With that, thanks very much. Jay, the floor is all yours. Yeah, again, uh, I think Jake missed a lot of the, the classes that dealt with basics of epistemology and metaphysics because Jake misunderstood a lot of points that I made, made some pretty rookie mistakes. For example, he appealed to my argumentation about realist uh, uh, notions of universals uh, on the basis of saying that, well, because we know this because of Occam's razor. Well, how do we know Occam's razor is true in all cases or true in this case? That's just an arbitrary appeal. It's just an appeal to some other thing that we don't actually know really grounds and disproves the reality of universals. He says, I didn't give arguments about universals. I gave multiple arguments about how there's no empirical verification or observation of metaphysical objects that Jake believes in. That is itself the undercutting and the disproof of his nominalism. Jake doesn't appear to be aware of classic critiques and refutations and questions for the nominalist empiricist tradition, which he's aligned himself with. <clears throat> First, uh, further, I would add to, I didn't delay the debate just because I needed to read one book. I asked him if he was willing to, to delay the debate because it's relevant for the, the debate that we're having. And it's a newly published book about the school of theology that he believes in. So that was the real reason for that. And he knows that, but he just is looking for anything to grasp at this point. So um, again, let's get back to this point about what, uh, what empiricism and nominalism says. Empiricism says that we begin our theology from sense data. I made the argument that we can't even know that the peripatetic axiom is true on the basis of sense data. There's nothing in sense data that tells you that knowledge comes from sense data. And if that's the case, then all of the arguments that David Hume makes about identity over time, meaning over time, those are all arguments. Now you'll notice that if you paid attention to my uh, slides and my talk, I did give arguments. I listed um, many, many arguments. And it's true, I did focus on Jake's position because I knew we would get to the Trinity in later discussions in the debate. I'm happy to defend any of the arguments that Jake has against the Trinity. But I want to know that uh, Tawheed actually makes sense. And, you know, Jake said that <clears throat> he made all of these arguments that I didn't address. I didn't actually hear an argument. I heard a bunch of assertions as to what his position is about the creed, what his position is about unity. I didn't actually hear an argument. So I don't think Jake understands the difference between asserting something and actually claiming something. I actually went into multiple texts, multiple scholars. I didn't just rely on one. And by the way, I want to address that he's wrong about what he says about, first of all, Boyarin. I didn't claim that, <clears throat> that uh, those Jewish theologians taught the Trinity. That's uh, false. So Jake's incorrect. I didn't say that they taught the Trinity. 
I said that they talked about the reality of multiple hypostases. That could be Binitarianism. That could be a form of Trinitarianism in certain Kabbalists. It could be uh, the other schools that were strictly Unitarian. I just simply pointed out that early Judaism was not monolithic, and that was enough to demonstrate that you couldn't use the argument that Daniel Hakikachu used, that the Old Testament was, quote, Unitarian, or that the prophets taught Unitarianism and that this is a corruption. It was just simply demonstrating that there were uh, Jews in the first couple, uh, first two centuries that were uh, not believers in strict Unitarianism, and by, beyond that, there were actually Jews who were Trinitarians, and they were called Christians. And that's why Boyarin says that Christianity is an, er, a conservative form of Judaism. So all I was doing was demonstrating that Daniel's arguments that Judaism is somehow inherently Unitarian are not true. That's all I needed to, to demonstrate. So he's setting up a straw man about something I didn't argue. <clears throat> Next, I'll uh, address the fact that uh, the Logos theology that, that he talked about, there's not one Logos theology that one guy had and everybody got this from Philo or someone else, and then it got rejected. Jake is completely ignorant of Athanasius, who, who engages in consistent Logos theology argumentation. He's the foremost theologian at the Council of Nicaea. So this idea that Logos theology is not used post-Nicaea or whatever dumb argument he made is totally not true. Clement of Alexandria, all the Alexandrian fathers in tradition often use this Logos argumentation. Some of the Logos apologists of the first and second century eventually did go into weird deviations, but that doesn't mean that all Logos theology is false. Logos theology is in John 1, and it's in the wisdom text of the Old Testament. It didn't, it didn't come out of Plato. <coughs> There's a plenty of scholarship that will note, as even some of these Jewish scholars do, that it goes back to the wisdom text, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and so forth. <clears throat> How that's cashed out by different theologians is a different question. So Jake doesn't understand what Logos theology is, <clears throat> and he doesn't understand uh, the first three centuries of Christianity. Um, I would uh, add as well that Jake doesn't understand what an internal critique is. <clears throat> he thinks that when I make an internal critique, that I have to then agree with the thing that I'm, I'm critiquing. So if I say that his position is anthropomorphic, I shouldn't have a problem with it because I'm a well, I believe in anthropomorphism. But dude, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm critiquing your position. So Jake doesn't un, literally doesn't grasp what an internal critique is. That's also why he doesn't understand what tag is. Jake, as we said, is a foundationalist. He's a very one-dimensional, one-layer thinker. So he doesn't understand meta-level questions, even though, ironically, he's called the Muslim metaphysician. So he ought to be at least aware of what metalogical issues are. That's what the transcendental argument is. He ought to be aware of metaphysical issues. I don't think he actually is. I think he copies and pastes out of various scholars that fit his need. For example, he uses us when he's arguing with Anthony Rogers. He uses, uh, you know, analytical, uh, uh, you know, William Lane Craig when he's so he's just picking and choosing when he when it fits the case. And he also seems to sort of move his positions in the midst of various debates. He has a history of that. So. I'm interested to see where he's going to go when we ask him about the attributes, whether they, they possess a seity uh, considered in themselves or not. He said that inseparability is not counting uh, by division, it's counting by identity. And then he proceeded to say that because we identify Allah's essence as one. He totally missed the point that I said. I said that he does both. That was the argument I made. I didn't say that he, he only counts by division by using the word inseparability. But he doesn't even seem to realize, realize that in the ancient and medieval world, whether it's Al-Ghazali, <clears throat> whether it's uh, Aristotle in Category 6, whether it's the Cappadocians, whether it's Maximus, whether it's the Nicene Creed, the ancient world consistently and commonly thought about counting by division. We use this argument all the time, especially when we refer to Maximus and the Ambigua. I think it's question one, where Maximus talks about unity being a single monad and then division being the separability that gives us two and then another form of separability which gives us the triad or gives us three i'm not talking about the trinity i'm just talking about counting that's how they thought that's how they counted right in moderation and belief this is how al ghazali counts for example so it was common in the ancient world jake doesn't even know this he thinks that it's something that was made up and then he thinks that everybody just quote counts by identity he says in one of his debates, this is just how we count today. It's like we count today like this. How come uh, y'all just don't even count like that? Not even aware that this is how people counted in his own uh, Islamic schools. Maybe not his school per se, 
because this wasn't an issue of debate. But Al Ghazali counts this way. I can show you in moderation of belief where he counts this way. For example, it's the tenth proposition. Here we go. Oh, he, he ain't got no Islamic books. He ain't done no reading. Oh, really? How about this right here, where Al Ghazali in the tenth proposition is counting by division? So <clears throat> Jay doesn't know what he's talking about. When we came to the body parts, however, I didn't say that Ibn Taymiyyah uh, uh, gave no cataphatic uh, meaning. I said he contradicted. So Jake said, well, there's a place in the Suleiman book where he says that, that it's, it's perfectly fine to speak this way. I didn't say that. I, did, I never claimed that. I claimed that he contradicts by saying two different things. So again, Jake didn't even understand the argument, or it went over his head, or he just didn't want to address it. And Jake, again, has a notorious uh, 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 history of in debates, not addressing any actual arguments. He blows past them, and he, because he literally thinks that asserting something is an argument. And you can see that when he came to the treatment of TAG. <clears throat> TAG is a meta-level argument about arguing and logic itself. And Jake says, well, what's the argument of the logic for that? Yeah, exactly. It's a pre-conceptual, pre-conditioned type of argument. Now, Jake is in the tradition of the empiricists, so I would think he would be pretty familiar with the ideas of analytic and synthetic truths One and a priori truths. How, how much? One minute left. One minute. <clears throat> But he doesn't seem to be aware of those things at all because his treatment of empiricism is naive empiricism. And again, when we get into cross-examination, we're going to see that uh, does he believe in self-evident truths like uh, his masters and his teachers do? And he says that, well, the, well those, uh, even to me, a book's not even relevant for this, for this uh, uh, debate. Yeah, you said it is relevant because you said that he's your Palamas. So why would he not be relevant, relevant for the debate when he's for us, he's a Palamas is a pillar of orthodoxy. You know that. I have the DM where you told me that he represents the Palamas for your tradition. So is he, so the, the pillar of your tradition isn't relevant for this debate? No, you just don't want to go to that because you know I did read it. And you want to stick to some other thing, some other text, when you know good and well that he's perfectly a representative of your tradition if he's the Palamas of your tradition. In time. This one. I just realized, so on, so thank you very much, gentlemen, for those rebuttals. Jake, I am sorry. I accidentally, you when you guys asked for the one-minute warnings, I screwed up mentally. And when I was supposed to give you your one-minute warning, I accidentally gave it to you where basically I, I accidentally gave you one less minute. So what I'm going to do is for these next rebuttals, which are supposed to be five and five minutes, I'm going to tack on that minute back on to yours, Jake, just to keep it fair. Sorry about that, my mistake. And so... We'll have so, these second rebuttals. Uh, just, just so I understand what you're saying. So I only spoke, I spoke for nine minutes instead of 10. So I'll be getting six minutes instead of five this time. Is that it? Exactly. Basically moving the, because it was my mistake, I cut you off a minute early. So taking that to keep it equal. So you have equal time in the debate. I'm going to take that missed minute. I'll, I'll let you, I'll rebuttal. let you, I'll let you slide, but it's going to come out of your pay, but that's fine. You got it. I'll still give you six if you want it. You don't have to. If you want to use five, that's fine. But with that, thank you very much, gentlemen. The floor is all yours. Jake, I've got it set for six minutes. I'll give you the warning at one minute until that's done. Okay, here we go. Six minutes. So, Jay, <laughs> you know, it, it's so funny to me that you say that I didn't, uh, that I'm just making assertions the whole time. Jake is only making assertions. He didn't hear any arguments. Well, I'll just repeat my arguments because, Jay, maybe you honestly didn't hear them. I have no idea because you didn't respond to a single argument that I gave. I actually engaged with your 15 minutes of nonsense to the best of my ability. You didn't engage with a single one of my arguments. You didn't respond to my arguments asserting that you guys are polytheists based on the LPT. You didn't respond to my argument about uh, them not having the same power or knowledge other than assuming that I said that these must be energies. No, my entire critique is that the Orthodox say that they're not energies. They make an exception between the begetting and the spirating and God's knowledge and these other things when they're not shared. And that's the whole problem with your universalist perspective is that you don't have the necessary and sufficient conditions for what an essence is. You make exceptions, and maybe you're not familiar with the classical critiques of the Aristotelian position regarding universals, which you basically hold to. 
that we can come up with all sorts of exception cases that you don't have answers to. And that's the point. You make an exception. You say, oh, they, they, ha they still have the same power, even though the Father alone has the power to beget the Son and the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the Catholics actually disagree on this point, and they make that very same argument that the Orthodox are guilty of saying that the Father alone has the power to cause another divine person, and because of that, they don't have equal power. So don't act like I just pulled this argument out of my backside. I didn't. Uh, let's go further here. Again, he keeps saying, I, I, I'm just making assertions. No, I've made arguments. I gave my argument on the LPT, whether you think it's ridiculous or not. I made the argument that they can't be the same God because they don't have the same power and knowledge. Now, let's get to this point that you made about um, knowledge. Okay, I have the quote here ready. All right, which is from Dimitri Staniloy. And he says in The Experience of God, Volume 1, page 152. I'd love to see what you think of this, Jay. He says, and I quote, The life of the eternal subjectivity must be a fullness, which in all respects is not a transitory one. It must consist in a love for another subjectivity and in a perfect union between itself and that subjectivity, which has the same fullness so as to be simultaneously unfailing life. The life of the eternal subjectivity is an infinite reference to its subjectivity contemplated within another I, within another quote-unquote I, so as to be true love, eternal, unfailing love. It is reference to another I, who is himself also the bearer of his own infinite subjectivity, and responds within that same eternal, unfailing love. A divine I loves with an eternal, inexhaustible love a thing proper to the divine or with its fullness, which is like that of another eye. And this occurs in reciprocity. This is divine life, this, this divine love, sorry, this is divine life and it exists together with immutable fullness. It is the same infinite existence of love, the love in, of an infinite person directed towards another person worthy of infinite love and vice versa. But within the inferior, interiority of the same subjectivity, in other circumstances, eternally would either be an unbearable boredom if it were the prerogative of a single consciousness, thereby he's saying there are three consciousnesses within the Trinity or three minds. Well, if three consciousness or three minds in the Trinity isn't polytheism, then I don't know what the hell is. What is the standard? And he's saying that that is the contemplation of another consciousness or else an absurdity if it were prerogative of a substance of law that was aimless. He's basically saying, oh my God, God would be bored if he didn't have another God to sit there and talk to. Okay, so don't make it seem like, oh, Jake has no idea. The Orthodox don't have this concept of knowledge. Well, what is he talking about here in the subjectivity of the different divine persons? They have a self-referential eye, which accounts for the mutual love. Otherwise, they would all be bored. And he says that if it were the prerogative of a single consciousness, meaning there are three consciousnesses in the Trinity, Jay. So how do you defend that three consciousnesses in the Trinity is not polytheism? One minute left. Now, back to the whole issue of epistemology, Jay thinks that I don't understand. I do understand the criticisms. And I knew that he was going to bring this critique because he doesn't want to talk about Trinity versus Tawhid. He wants to talk about epistemology because he knows that he can't respond to my actual arguments. So he's spending the entire time trying to criticize my position without a defense of his own position in response to my arguments. And he wants to make the debate about epistemology. But I knew he was going to do that. That's why I included that in my opening statement. But I'd be happy to have an entirely separate debate about epistemology. Epistemology. But Jay wants to make it only about that in this debate because he know he can't defend his actual position. But I'd be happy to go through that. And if you want to talk about self-evident truths, I'd be happy to talk about that. But whatever your critiques are of them, as you've already admitted, you can't give a justification to something that is metalogical. And therefore, I can tell you the same exact thing. And we're at an intellectual stalemate. And time. With that, we're going to kick it over to Jay for his five-minute rebuttal. want to let you know, folks, at the very end, they'll have their closing statements, or I should say second to the end, which will be flipped. In other words, different from usual, it'll actually be instead of Jake going first and then Jay, it'll be flipped, where it'll instead 
we'll explain when we get there. With that, wait, thank wait, you very wait, much, wait. Hold, hold on a second. What? What? I didn't understand what you just said. I'll like I, I'm putting the cart before the horse. I'll explain that once we get there. But you had mentioned it earlier in our discussion on how you guys wanted it, so I'll I'll bring it up later though. But Jay, okay. thank you very much. The floor is all yours. Yeah. So I just wanted to point out here that one of the things that would definitely help uh, Jake in the future, if he wants to understand the history of Christian metaphysics and the distinctions that he he's not able to actually make is uh, this great book here, Christian Theology and the uh, End of Ancient Metaphysics. And this is the, a new recent book in the scholarship. Uh, it, it's by Johann Zakuber, and it's really good for pointing out that we don't, for example, think that the essence of God is a universal. This is a fundamental mistake. I don't know where he got this. Uh, I think he misunderstood the idea of the comparison between the Cappadocians saying that the essence of God is common and therefore it's like the relationship between a universal and a particular, but the essence of God itself is not actually a universal in the sense of uh, the way that we understand universal. St. Maximus, so the confessor famously see, uh, teaches, as does John Damascus, that universals are created. God is not created, and so universals cannot be the essence of God. So Jake misunderstood an analogy comparing the universal uh, relationship between uh, the creatures and the participation that they have in uh, the one in regard to the many versus the uh, relationship uh, of the one and the many in God. It's just an analogy that Cappadocians make, and so Jake misunderstood that very fundamental misunderstanding. Jake equivocated on uh, the term power. Uh, so I'm going to quit screen sharing there. <clears throat> so what I said was is that for that argument to hold, which is actually a eunomian argument, uh, the, the notion uh, of begetting would have to be an energy. And this is the argument that Eunomius makes against Nyssa in uh, against Eunomius. <clears throat> and the argument is that begetting is not a power. So Jake's just equivocating on the distinction between hypostatic properties and powers. And the fact that Roman Catholics uh, claim this really has nothing to do with our debate. Roman Catholics claim all kinds of things. Jake doesn't believe in Roman Catholicism. So he wants to try to use an argument as if that would have any weight in this debate really doesn't matter what Roman Catholics say. He says, I didn't reply to the LPT. I did reply to the LPT. I pointed out that his argument and his use of it relies on counting in one way, counting by identity. I specifically addressed twice now that both of us count by identity and both of us count by division. I gave multiple people in the past who count this way. Jake ignored all that. Jake acts like this is all made up. In, the, in recent uh, live streams and talks, he's actually acted like, why don't y'all count the way everybody does today? not even aware of the basic fact that the ancient medieval world counted also this way. I mentioned in my opening statement, first order and second order in position, that certain things can be counted by identity and certain things can be counted by division, even back in the ancient medieval world. This became a medieval distinction, first order, second order in position. If we want to go back to my opening statement, <clears throat> I said that uh, you could think of things like let me see where I put this. You could uh, let me see. You, you could think of things like <clears throat> first order imposition would be things like mundane objects of uh, cats, cows, dogs. Uh, so they would be concrete objects in the world. And then you could think about <clears throat> uh, abstract objects like sets or laws of logic. Those would be counted by identity because it doesn't really make sense to think of, for example, uh, one third of a law of logic or one third of, of a, a, a a set of things, right? So abstract things in this case, created abstract things, <clears throat> would be counted by uh, identity. But things that might be parted or are divisible have to be counted by division. And this is actually in even today's literature. So Jake's acting like, we don't count this way today, dog. We don't count this way today. Oh, really? Well, I mean, I've got academic scholars here talking about the uh, theory of mathematics and countings like, like, like the uh, David Liebsman paper where he goes into great detail arguing that, no, actually, we do still count by division. You just have to be more nuanced about it. I specifically argued, again, that Jake, in his own accounting for the attributes and the essence, also counts by identity and by division. And he used the very terminology that relates to counting by division. And he got upset by that. He got a little rattled and they had to say, that's not what it means, bro. That's not what it means, dog. Now, he, he mentioned the idea of Unitarianism and uh, modes. Uh, Jake doesn't understand the difference between <clears throat> person, nature, and mode. It's very important for Trinitarian theology to make a distinct, distinction between hypostasis, 
nature, person, nature, and mode or tropos. Mode is the way that a thing exists. <clears throat> Islamic theology is kind of all over the place, and they use modality in a lot of different ways. It's kind of unclear and contradictory between you know, different uh, Islamic thinkers as, as to what exactly they think modality means. Sometimes it relates to parts, whole relationships. Sometimes it means relation to other objects. And sometimes it means the actual way that the mode in which it exists, the way a thing exists or how it exists. So in Orthodox theology, we're using it in that sense of how a thing uh, exists. Pardon, I missed the reminder. That's so off today. So thank you very much. we're going to kick it over to, we're changing it up in the format. We're now going to the three sets of seven minute cross-examinations. This is going to be more formal for our cross-examinations, folks. So we are looking for just questions on one side and just question or just answers on the other side. With that, Jake, the floor is yours to interrogate Jay right now. Okay, just give me one second because I'm starting my timer here. Okay, I'm ready. Jay, so you said that uh, you're wondering, where did I get this idea that the divine essence is a universal? So let me read you from your good friend, Dr. Bo Branson, in his PhD dissertation on page 168 on the section 4.2.1 UCI and hypothesis. In Gregory of Nyssa on Universals, Richard Cross argues persuasively, in my view, that St. Gregory and St. Basil both use the term usia synonymously with nature, and they conceive of this as a universal. And then in the rest of the section, he goes on to explain just that, that the divine essence is conceived of as a universal by the Cappadocians. So what do you have to say in response to your buddy saying that? Yeah, the Zach Cooper book actually treats this, that the notion of universal uh, evolves over time between the way the Cappadocians use it and the way that the post-Chalcedonian uh, uh, fathers use it up into John Damascus and St. Maximus. So what's relevant for our debate in terms of uh, human universals is not whether or not God's essence is common, but whether or not there are created universals. So that's what I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, but my, so my, question, my, question is, my question is, does Bo Branson believe in this passage and what he argues for in his dissertation that the divine essence is a universal? Yes or no? You're equivocating on the term universal. Does he say that the divine essence is a universal? You're equivocating on the term universal. Okay, so you want to universal? The do you think universal? I'm going to move on. I'm going to move so, on. So universal only has the, one sense. I'm going to move on because it's clear it only has to one the audience. Sense. It's clear to the audience that you can't say that. Now let's move on to the LPT. You claim that I am counting by division within God. Explain how I'm counting by division within God. When you use the term inseparable, <laughs> I use the term inseparable means that I'm separation counting by means division? division. Separation means how division. How am I using that to count? Well, you said that the attributes are inseparable. Exactly. But how many attributes are there? Are there one or many? Well, is God's essence one? How many attributes are there, one or many, according to my position? You, have, you, you believe in many. Okay, they're many, and yet they're inseparable. So if they're inseparable from each other, and there's many, how am I counting by division, genius? No, in terms of the essence, you count by division by saying that it's one. No, there's one essence. Right. That's, that's well, where, right. Where, where is it? So where he's undivided, it? correct? Where is there accounting by division? There is none. Okay, exactly. It doesn't well, mean that you're. On. It doesn't you, mean that you're you, saying you divided. You made a huge. So you're, not you're, me, even, you're not going to let. You're not going to let. It doesn't you mean that you think he's divided. You don't, you don't even understand the basics of this conversation. Let's I do move understand on. The basics let's, of it. let's let's move on. You don't understand the the word. Now let now let's get to. Uh, some other issues. What is the difference between tefwid al mana and tefwid al kefia? I don't know your terms. You don't know? No. So you have no idea what that means? No. Okay, and yet you think you're able to critique our position when these are basic terms. Is your, relig your religion made for all the exactly, world? Exactly. So ex is yeah, it just but, for Arabs or but, all the world? No, but even when I'm critiquing the Trinity, I'm aware of the basic terms of what a hypostasis is, what well, an know some terms. is. I'm under. I understand the basics. So is this is this a debate about grammar? Or this is a debate, a debate about, about the fact that you're ignorant of our tradition. Thank you very much. Now let's so move a, on. So you let's want to make it about grammar? Next, and let's move on to the next question. Why is it problematic to believe that the persons are identical to the essence, as Thomas Aquinas and many Catholics hold? Why is that problematic? Uh, because it basically ends up in reducing person to nature, and it would be modalism. Okay, so you, would you consider that position heretical? 
Yeah, if you mean identity in the sense of uh, reductionist identity. Okay, so the Trinity, if you conceive of when you say the Father is God, that the Father is identical to God, would you agree that that's logically problematic because then it would follow that the Father is identical to the Son? Well, identity can be a, uh, the sense of is of identity or a predication. Yeah, I'm saying, and the Catholics make it explicit. There's there's no difference between the person and the nature Correct. in terms of the Thomists. So right. they say the Father is identical to the nature or essence, and so are the Son and the Holy Spirit, which by the logic of identity would follow that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are identical to each other. Do you agree with that critique? I think you could make that argument. That's why I said modalism. Do you know what okay. modalism is? Yeah, you exactly. know what modalism is? Yes, I do know what okay. modalism is. So, yeah, so you're I, just asking I, me again what I, I already I, said. It, no, because I want so you're you asking to be, me again I, what I, I want you to be more explicit, but I'm supposed to ask questions, not you. Thank you very much. Now, how many persons are there in the Trinity? Three. Are they separated by time or space? No. So you count the persons by identity and not division, right? Correct. Okay, does God have one eternal attribute or energy or more than one? More than one. Are his eternal attributes separated from each other by time or space? No. Okay, so you count the attributes by identity and not division, right? Correct. Okay, so if we count gods in the Trinity by the same method of identity, how many gods would we count? Depends on what God picks out. If we're talking about the persons. Three. So there would be three gods if we counted by identity and the same method that we count the attributes or eternal energies and the persons, correct? Right. Okay. Your friend Bo Banson says... Little, that, little G God, as you know. Okay. So your friend, so there would be three little G gods. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Your friend Bo Branson says that today we count by identity. So that would mean by the standard way in which we count today, there would be three gods in the Trinity, correct? The way that we count today is talking about post frega Okay, so and that's, by, and that's says, analytical. And I'm going to quote what he says. I'm going to quote what Counting he says. Counting by identity. So today we count. So you don't S. want me to answer it. Today we count. No, I'm answering. I'm going to give you more. Yeah, you're answering. Yeah, you're answering. Today, exactly. today you ask count, the questions and then you today answer. Today we count F's by one logical subjects that are discernible from, or at least not identical to one another, and R F. That is, X and Y are diff. If if X and Y are different in any way and are both F ish, we count them as two F's. So that's in his explanation that we count today by identity, yet you're quoting these other sources, which is not even my argument. My argument is that you're inconsistent in your methodology. So do you have no, any, only if you think that you, you only if you think you, you, have, you count in one way? No, no, no. It's not about one counting. I already forgive me. I already addressed them. I got to I've got to see if uh, you can ask a question, Jake, just to keep it as strict as possible. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question. What is the justification or argument for why we must count persons and attributes in God by identity, but count gods by another method other than simply trying to avoid that you're a polytheist? By the example that I gave from first order and second order imposition and the way that all of the ancient world counted. So there is no justification. That you're not, was, you're not that asking why argument. we count the attributes and the persons by identity. But we and count we because count different things are, because what what you can't understand is that different gotta, things. I'll give you a chance ways. to answer exactly. The question, but you're not giving Jay, an ad but, no, and then I've got to wrap us up. I give you. I'll give you a chance to answer the question, Jay, and then I've got to wrap us up. Okay, that's can I can I answer what he question. asked? He just talked the whole time and didn't let me answer. You can an <laughs> you can answer the last question he asked. Yeah. So different things are counted in different ways. That's what I argued. And I've argued that from my opening statement, your argument hinges on only counting in one way. And you're taking out of context the fact that Dr. Branson said that most people today post Frega think of counting in one way. When this is a dispute about the way that people in the ancient and medieval world counted, which is not by strictly by identity. We'll jump into the seven minutes of Jay interrogating Jake. The floor is all yours, Jay. Jake, you said that uh, you do. Uh, you're happy to affirm this sort of empiricist uh, nominalist position, and that seems to necessitate the idea that all of the knowledge that we have comes from either sense data or relations of ideas. I'm just curious if you think that the peripatetic axiom itself is found in sense data. That's not my position. When did I ever say that I'm an empiricist? Well, if you're a nominalist, you're an empiricist. How does that follow? Well, you're how supposed you to ask the question. So you disagree with uh, how, what most people in your tradition? No. So you're not an empiricist? 
I'm not an empiricist by the standard that you just laid out. Well, so you don't think the knowledge comes from sense data? I do, but I don't think it's limited to sense data. I didn't limit it to that. I said also yeah, relations. Said. I said relations of ideas. Yeah, I don't think it's limited to those two. Okay, where else do we? Where, where else does knowledge come from? The fitra. And that is what? Do you know what it is? No, I don't. That's why I asked you. Okay. Well, similar, kind of similar to your concept of the noose. So a direct perception of God? Yes. How do you directly perceive God if, uh, as Ibn Tamiya says, God cannot be seen? What do you mean? He says God cannot be seen? Of course God can be seen. Oh, how can God be seen? How can God be seen? I guess, Jay, you're not familiar with our You're giggling. Yeah, well, that's why we're asking I mean, you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm Jay, asking, we're asking you that. I'm asking you. Yeah, and it's, and it's showing how can God be seen? Is he showing, seen with the eyes? It's, yes, he is. It's showing that your ignorance that you don't even know. That we, that I, I'm we glad believe. you think I'm ignorant. So that's it, why you exactly. get the chance to you get the exactly. chance to enlighten us. I'm trying to so if you slow down, soldier. If you slow down, soldier, I will. Yes. The how, how is God seen by the eyes? I, I'm, if you allow me to talk, I'll tell you. By the beatific vision, we believe in the afterlife that we do see God with the eyes. Correct. How do you, but has anybody in this life seen God? No. Does God have a physical form? Not with the eyes. Form? Not with the eyes. Does God have a physical form? Uh, define what you mean by physical. The body parts that are listed. We don't believe God has body parts, no. Well, you believe he has a foot, right? Uh, we believe, yes. We do believe he has a foot. We believe his hand. What is a foot that's or? nothing like a created foot? What is a foot that's nothing like a created foot? Right. The same thing, the same thing that an essence is that's nothing like a created essence. Yeah, but our argument is not based on analogy for essence. I'm saying that any predicate that we ascribe to God and creation, there is a similarity in meaning, but it doesn't follow from that okay. that there and is what's a that similarity. Meaning? What's that similarity of meaning? Let me finish. Does not follow from that that there is a similarity in ontology, which is I know that. completely new. Yeah, I understand. No, I understand that that's the Ibn Tamiya position. So I'm asking, what is the so similarity? what's the problem with it? What is the similarity? What is the similarity in terms of the meaning? The color and what color. is that? You're just saying meaning. What is yes. that? So we know it based on the text. So if uh -huh. you go to the example, if you go to the example, okay. is, is all of that I'm empirically gonna, derived? I'm is gonna, the meaning I'm, empirically derived? If you if you allow me to finish, if you go to the text that describe the yed or the the foot, for example, the hands are described as being responsible for directly creating Adam. So this is how we understand the meanings of the text. So you reference the attributes uh, in context. So you reference another created object, right? What's the created object? The know. text. No, the text is not created. The the text that you read is created, right? The papers and the ink is yeah, created. Yeah, exactly. That's the, the papers. Text. The papers and the ink, but the words are That's uncreated. called the text. I know you're talking about the eternal Quran. That's not what I'm talking no, about. No, I'm not talking about I don't even believe in an eternal Quran. What are you talking so, about? So so the the text that you derived that knowledge from is empirical, right? The text that I derived I don't understand the so question. Yeah, you don't understand the question. Exactly. No, I don't. It doesn't make right. any sense. Yeah, you, you think I believe in no, a you don't empirically Quran. read you the Quran. Know my position. You don't empirically read the Quran. Yes, we do. That was the question I asked you. So you we do read, we read but you did understand Quran, it, you just didn't want to ask you didn't want to answer it. You understood it then. No. <laughs> You, you're, yeah. you're, you you're empirically not even able to ask you me appropriate questions. You, I asked you that. Yeah, and then you, you think I believe it. in an eternal Quran? Where does it say that in the book you read? I'm asking you about your empiricism, which you don't want to talk about. And no, you I'm, said I'm, that. I'm very so what is a created foot? What is it? What is a foot that's nothing like a created foot? And I explained it to you. No, you didn't. I explained it to you. I said, you said it's known. Go to these I texts. Said, I said it's known. So it's I said circle. it's known through the text. It's a, right, which is a circle of empirical. Sense data, which is what I'm asking what's, you about. What's, what's the circle? How do we from, know? How do we know about? From empiricism to another empirical piece of data to another empirical piece of data, you can never get out of this loop. That's why that's a problem for empiricism. No, it's not because it's the same thing when it comes to divine revelation according to the orthodox. How do you know about? That's the a trinity? two quote way. No, it's not. That's no, a two quote way. I want to know your know, position. How do you know about you're, the trinity? You know about you the said trinity in the you same said manner. You're, you know about the Trinity you said in the this same comes manner. To, uh, a moderator, revelation. he doesn't answer the questions. He just talks over me. <laughs> You're complaining I to the moderator. That's a two quote way. Back. Hold on one sec. I do this want to is, reset. So hold on. To, I asked him about I can his answer position. the questions, however. No, I Jake, I'm asking. I, uh, <laughs> I asked about his position, and he said, your view of divine revelation, that's a two quote way. I'm asking about his position, which he won't explain. 
Okay, James, whether or not my response is a fallacy is for the audience to decide. No, moderators can, are involved I in can, that. I can I don't know answer, if you know that. Moderators can, step in. Yeah, and I can answer and I can say. You're not answering. I can, an, I can You're answer. You're deflecting. Give, I you can won't answer. answer. I, uh, I can I give any say, answer but, I want. Yeah, I exactly. Say, we only have that a minute was. left in this section. <laughs> I can give any. You can say answer anything I want. you want, which is what you're doing. Exactly, I'm answering your question. You just don't like the answer because no, you saying can't anything critique that you want my position. Let's just do one last, one last, just to be sure I understand the question. Jay, if you can ask yeah, it one ahead. more time for me. Right. So I asked for his basis for knowing what the Quran teaches, which is empirical sense data. And I'm trying to get at the point that he can never get out of the domain, the veil of empirical sense data to ever actually know anything about Allah himself, because much like the Thomas position, he's stuck in only seeing and interacting with created effects. So I'm trying to figure out, he says, well, in the future, there'll be this direct uh, perception of no. Allah in the beatific vision. And I'm asking about the here and the now. How do you ever get yeah. out of the box of the challenge of human skepticism? Yeah. And I'm saying that we have a direct possession, a uh, direct experience of God right now through the concept of the fitrah, which I explained. But since you don't even know what it is, it's no well, surprise that you don't explain, understand. Explain what it is. So you're just. So you're I, I did. I gave you explaining. a corollary within Orthodox theology where I explained that it's similar to the concept of noose. Where there is a direct experience you said of at, God, you said in the eschaton. A direct, no, 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 no. Yes, you did. No, no, no. You're confusing you a seeing God with a direct experience of God. Those are not the same thing. Jim. So is that had in this life? Yes, there's a direct experience of God right now that is not through some inferential process. It's not based on argumentation. Is it through this, the Quran? We, we are at the end of the seven minutes for that section. We might have to come back to this and the next yeah. set. But sure, I have the clock set for seven minutes for you, Jake, to interpret Jay. Okay, give or, me one uh, second. Interrogate, uh -huh. not interpret. <laughs> well, I got to interpret what he's saying. But hold Jay. on a second. Let me just get my uh, thing here. Okay. All right, I'm ready whenever you are, James. Ready. Okay. All right, Jay, we're back at it again. Let's go to the next issue. All right. How many men are on this stage right now between Jake, James, and uh, Jay? None, because we're not on a stage. Okay, on this platform. Three. There's four. three men. Okay, how come you don't count the same way in which Gregory of Nyssa counts Peter, James, and John, three men in his work, on not three gods, when he says that there's only one man. Because I already explained different things are counted different ways. And you're counting three men as saying they're three men, but Gregory of Nyssa counts them as one man. Well, they're one in terms of nature. And Gregory says that it's more appropriate to call them one man, and that actually our way of calling them three men is incorrect. So it's better to change that than to call the persons of the Trinity three gods. That's his entire argument. So you, by, by you saying that there's three men here, you're actually disagreeing. No, it's just two different senses of the same word, which you constantly equivocate on. Okay, Richard Cartwright says on this passage, it seems to have been left to Gregory of Nyssa, Basil's younger brother, to notice that thus understood consubstantiality of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit appears to license saying that there are three gods. Gregory himself rather desperately suggested that strictly speaking, there is only one man. So do you agree that there's three men on this platform or one? There's one man, there's one human nature. In that sense, man can pick out nature, which is a common thing. And there's three men uh, as individuated. Okay. Gregory says about the logical problem of the Trinity, he says this question, which was asked to him by another bishop, is very difficult to deal with. If we should be able to find anything that may give support to the uncertainty of our mind so that it may longer totter and waver in this monstrous dilemma, it would be well. On the other hand, even if our reasoning found unequal to the problem, we must keep forever firm and unmoved the tradition with which we received by succession from the fathers. So Gregory is saying that the problem is difficult. Do you agree with that? Uh, depending upon how you cash it out, if you think that the logical problem of the Trinity is identical to the Arian disputes, then you're engaging in anachronism. 
this isn't about an Aryan dispute. This is specifically where he sets up the problem in his work on not three gods mm -hmm. in responding to a Blabius where he's asking him, well, we say yeah, that the you're... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each God. Yeah, but and you're yet making we a mistake. Forbid, we forbid yeah. men to say that there are three gods. So this is the very problem of yeah. tritheism. No, it, we forget. We forbid three gods if you mean three natures. Okay, so here we go. Next question. So, according do you understand? To you, according to you, the Father has the power to cause another divine person and alone causes the Son and the Holy Spirit. I, I already answered do this. The, You're equivocating on power. Do the Son and Holy Spirit have the power to cause another divine person? You're equivocating on power. Power is not an energy. Do the Son, I didn't ask about energy. Do the Son and Holy Spirit. No, but Spirit, your, your argument is saying the, that. Do your the argument, Son and Holy Spirit have the ability to cause another divine person? Causing a divine person is not an energy. Do they have the ability to cause another divine person? No. Okay, they don't. Thank you. If no, then do they have the same power? That's only if power is viewed as an energy. And I just argue that the power that we're talking about here is not really correctly called power. It's called begetting. Okay, but it has to do with an action, doesn't it? Well, it's act in a different sense than energy, and that's what Athanasius argued against the Arians. Yeah, I'm not asking about energy. I'm but asking about the your argument of all power. Your and argument power, power is a, what power is what an agent is able to do. Do you no, agree? Power is no. There's multiple senses to the word power. Okay, so when I say that God is all powerful, I mean that He can do whatever is metaphysical. There's first powerful. actuality, second actuality, and there's I'm power. So I'm divining. Are you going to let me finish? I didn't you ask just, you a question yet. You, you did. Him, no, you I didn't. asked multiple I'm questions and then you immediately you, thought. I'm explaining there's, there's to you first what, actuality, I'm explaining second to actuality. what the understanding of power is. I'm giving I, you my you don't definition. Know the, you don't know the, you I'm don't giving know the, you my that. definition of power. I don't I'm care giving about you your my definition, definition of power. My definition of power is your whatever, definition is not whatever, relevant. whatever a being can possibly do. Now I'm asking That's you, not our view. does the so, son have the same ability to do whatever the father can do? Yes or no? It's it's equivocating on the word power. I just you gave know? you the definition of power. I, that's your definition. I don't exactly. So, so, so you, answer yeah. according so, to my so, definition. So you understand that every argument that you make, where you reduce words to having a single definition, just restates your position. So that's no, why it it's an invalid move. No, it doesn't. It does. No, it doesn't because the Catholic. So you're not interested in our. I suppose versus, this might be a good opportunity to, to. It could be that uh jay if you want to answer it according to your own definition of power and you can share that definition and then if you're willing to humor jake's question using jake's definition of power right so jake wants a single definition of what power is according to what he says it is and if he's going to critique our position then it needs to be our understanding of first actuality second actuality which we ascribe to god and there's different senses to power i can have power as a potentiality that i possess that i don't actualize I could also have power as an actualized uh, uh, energy that I'm engaging in. Or sometimes, in the sense of Athanasius talking about the Father begetting, he says you could call this an act, but it's not act in the same way that God as a triad acts in terms of the energies. So Jake's argument hinges on reducing the word uh, act to having one sense in God, and we simply don't have that view. Okay, that's not my argument, but let's move on that to the next question. That is your argument. That's what you argue. Let's move on to the next question here. Does the so you're moving father, on because it doesn't work. Does the father no because you've already been refuted. Does the you, father you does the father have the ability to become incarnate? We're not told that. So you don't know, you're agnostic on the proposition. Well, there's nothing about that, so there's no I'm reason asking you, that. do you know about it or not? Can the father become incarnate? I, I, you're, so you're not even letting me answer, you're just immediately cutting me off. I, I asked just you a question. Said, I just simply said there's not any information about that. And the way that Jesus speaks is that no one has seen the Father at any time. So there's no incarnation of the Father. Okay, so people have interpreted John of Damascus as arguing that the Father cannot be incarnate when he says in his Exposition of Orthodox Faith, Book 4, the Father is the Father and, the, and not the Son. The Son is Son and not Father. The Holy Spirit is Spirit and not Father or Son. For, or Father or Son. For the individuality is unchangeable. How indeed could the individuality continue to exist at all if it were 
ever changing and altering. Wherefore, the Son of God became Son of Man in order that his individuality might endure. So he's arguing that this must include that the Son only can become incarnate in order for the individuality of the distinctions between the persons. So do you agree no. with that interpretation? I'll give it's you the individuality. Chance for Jay, and then we've, we've actually just hit the seven minute. I'm mark, just asking, do you agree chance. with that interpretation? That's all. It's the individuality of the persons as known by us. So uh, has not the incarnation is not what lets us know or what conditions the distinctions in the triad. We'll kick it over to Jay for his seven minutes to interrogate Jake. The floor is yours. Jake, earlier when you were talking about uh, your view of epistemology and whatnot, do you agree with the position of Ibn Tamiya as related on page 196 of the Suleiman book that the principles of reasoning are self-evident truths. Uh, I would have to look at the reference, but define self-evident. Not relying on anything else to be the case. Uh, I believe that they are known directly through the fitra. And that is what? Uh, what I explained before, similar to the What noose. is what? What is what? I said I explained it before, similar to the noose. Okay, so every individual in an inner sense just knows self-evidently that what the law of logic is true, the laws of logic are true? Uh, he knows that certain principles like that a half is less than a whole, he knows these things directly, not through some type of inference. So are they self-evident? Self-evident only in the sense that he knows them directly through the fitra. Okay, so they and don't not, rely on... They're not they, from an inference. You so, don't they don't rely, so they don't rely on anything else to be true? Uh, they rely on God to exist to create us with that fit on, we don't, apparatus. We don't know that that's the case yet. So you do you do believe they're self-evident? I know. I said <laughs> they're not self-evident in in the sense that you're no, to human about. perception. They're not dependent on human perception. They're prior. To I didn't say perception. are they dependent. I said are they self-evident to human perception? Self-evident in the sense that they are known directly through the fitra as an apparatus. Okay. So uh, how do we? adjudicate between the things that are self-evident and the things that aren't uh by, by the fact of our existence we know that a, for example a half is greater than a whole and, and that's a, a fallacy. so that's a fallacy i mean sorry a whole is greater than a half yeah that's a fallacy. No, they're, they're, appealing they're, to existence doesn't justify the truths i'm i make i explain to you how it's because we know them directly through the fitra so we know them the because we know way. them so that's no, a no, circle no. no it isn't I, I explained how we know them. You just said we know them because we exist and experience them. That's a circle. No, I said I said that we experience them uh -huh. through the apparatus of the fitra, which God has created human beings upon. Yeah, but how do, we know, how do we know the difference between those and the non-self-evident truths is what I asked you. You said by existence. Because they're self-evident, as you just said. Oh, so now you do believe in self-evidence. Self-evident in the sense that they're not based upon inference. And how do we know those distinct from the ones that aren't? Because you know when you make an inference and when you don't. And if you don't, then oh, you have so a Oh, so we just problem. know. So reality is reality. So T-Jump, did you get if this you from T-Jump? If you don't, do you know the difference between when you're making an inference and when you're not? Uh, I'm asking you questions, not you. Exactly. Right. So I'm telling you. We but know the so, difference between when we make an inference and when we don't make an inference. Yeah, but that's not answering the question. I'm, yes, I'm, asking, for the, I'm asking for the justification for the division between the self-referential and the non-self-referential. What's the justification? The justification is that the self-referential, which you're talking about, the self-evident ones, mm -hmm. do not rely upon inference where other so people So they're self-evident because they're self-evident. No, they're self-evident. Self Evident because they don't reply on inference, and you're so asking how do we know that? Because they're how do we know that? Because when I make an argument, when I make an argument, and I appeal to an inference rule, I know that I'm appealing to an inference rule. So there's so that's a circle, Jake. This is a basic epistemology problem for it's, your empiricism. Do you have a question, sir? Oh, exactly. <laughs> you have a question. You ready for me to move on? I'm, no, I'm asking you if okay. you have a question. So how do we know the phase? difference between the self-referential self, self already ones your and the non? I already answered your question. You no, you didn't. You, you just restated that we know, they're self -evident. We know. No, how, no, you said, how do we know that yeah. they're self-evident? How do we know the difference? How this do is, we know? It's called the criteria problem. No. How do we know yes, that Yes, it is. It's called the criteria. We, uh, that's Are you not familiar with the criteria problem? I'm not problem? answering. I'm not answering. That. I know what the criteria problem is. And what is it? That's not my point. I'm saying to you. That's my question. So yeah, that's and why I'm you're saying, saying it's not your and point. And I'm saying to you that you're asking me, how do I know the difference between what's self-evident and what is known right. through an inference? No, between what's not self-evident. Right. 
And the opposite of not being self-evident is something that is known through. So the you're in the criterion process. problem, Jake. It's, <laughs> you're I've giggling. explained it. I've explained it three times. It's very no, simple. You explained to understand. it, but it's not answering the criterion problem. Do you if know what you it don't is? know, if you don't know the difference, do you know between, what the criterion problem you, is? I already answered that question. Do you know what the problem is? Yes. What is it? I do. You just what, explained what the it? problem to Moderator, me. Moderator, he won't answer. Uh, do you know who's associated with it? Who's associated with what? The criteria problem. It's a problem in epistemology. Yeah. Who's, who's associated with it? I don't know who the origin is. You're right. Is. So it's David Chisholm. So how do you answer the criteria problem? I'm, I'm giving you an answer. No, I've been it. doing it for the past five minutes. So you'll you notice in the debate, Jake keep repeating just talks the same and he doesn't can, answer the objection. No, I asked, and he says I that it's self-evident because it's self-evident. No, I never said that. Never you did said say that. that. Everybody oh, heard him say it's self-evident because it exists. And we don't. That's what I said. That is what you, you said. said. How do we know? And I said, yeah. we know it through a divinely created apparatus. Well, that's, that's how we know it. We, we don't know, know that yet. This is your starting point. What do you mean? We're talking about starting point. points. You're appealing to divine apparatuses. I'm talking about the starting point. No, I'm saying that that according to our epistemology, mm -hmm. the fitra is how we know these things, and we know that because it's we're created upon it. Yeah, but the question is about do you know that you're created that way? And you're just saying, well, we're made that way. That's my question. Yeah, I'm saying we know we're created because we have a direct experience. No, I'm asking about the principles of reason themselves. And yes. you said you believe in self-evidence. And then I said, okay. And then I asked you the criterion problem. And you haven't answered the criterion problem. You keep talking around it. I've answered your question no, you several times. I, your answer was circular. Explain the circle. Because you said that, well, I know it's self-evident because it's self-evident. And when I'm not doing something that's an inference, that's not answering the criterion problem. No, you asked how, how do I know it? What's the justification? I, I explained. Asked the, you don't I even explained, understand the question. You want to state the, the question again? I so what is the, the justification. What is the justification for the, for the belief that you know the difference between the self-evident ones and the non-self-evident ones? So the criteria problem is saying that you have a more fundamental criteria by which you cash out these two different things and put them into different classes. How do you know that more fundamental uh, Chisholm issue is what I'm asking? Yeah, and I'm repeating the same exact answer. We know it based on the fact that we are created by God with a direct that's a, experience that's a, of those that's things. That's a circle that, that doesn't a, justify the criteria problem. That doesn't tell us, of, Jake, that doesn't tell us how we know the, the, the fundamental yeah. criteria is the case. We are out of time. We've got to kick it over to Jake to interrogate Jay, and this is our final set. So we'll have one seven-minute section of Jake interrogating Jay. And then one last interrogation of Jay on Jake. With that, Jake, the floor is all yours. Sorry about that. I'm just uh, getting my notes up here. No problem. Folks, if you haven't yet, check out our guests linked below. There's a value in hearing their positions firsthand from them. This debate is a great introduction to their views, but check out their channels. That includes at the podcast. We've linked both of our guests below. Okay, I'm ready. Ready. Okay, Jay, do you have an argument or justification for the claim that the Trinity and Orthodox uh, theology or the Orthodox Church specifically is a precondition for rationality, intelligibility, and all the other transcendental categories. Do you have an argument and justification for that? Yes. What is it? It's a two-parter. Can I, can I explain it? Yeah, go ahead. So the first part is that it's a reductio ad absurdum argument when you deny it. This is called retorsion in Aristotelian argumentation. And the second part of the argument is to posit the Christian worldview as the way to ground the transcendental categories that are the preconditions for all possible knowledge. Yeah, you're saying to posit them, but what's the justification for the claim that it is the only system that can account for those things? Is there, Re do you provide arguments or not? Retorsion, correct. The first, the first one is retorsion. Okay, explain what retorsion is. Do you know, you're Jake the Muslim metaphysician. You I know, know what it is, but I've actually seen in your, okay, what is it? I've actually seen in your videos. Okay, what is it? You're not asking me questions. I'm asking you questions. You've explained in your videos that you critique the Thomists when they bring up the issue of retortion. So can you explain it and explain how when they use it, they're not justified in doing so, but you are? 
Because they're classical foundationalists like you, and it's a reductio argument. I'm not a classical foundationalist. Now, it's a reductio. You are. In the, you are. I'm, not, I'm not a classical foundationalist. You are. So you're going to tell me my own epistemology. I mean, the so, way you argued in the last no, uh, comment, I, I, the, in the last I'm section. Not, I'm not a classical foundationalist. The way now, you just argued. Again, I'm going to ask you. believe in self-evident truths. I'm going to ask you again, You believe in self-evident truths, so you're lying. I'm, I'm, I'm asking now you're lying, you because you are I'm a asking, classical I'm, right, I'm just, asking let's, let's you questions, give, Jack. Yeah. I'm, I'm supposed to be asking him questions, just to be clear. Okay, Jay, again, I'm going to ask you, when you critique the Thomist, you're saying the only reason is because they're a classical foundationalist and you're not. How does that affect the legitimacy of them making the same move that you are? Because like you, they don't understand a meta-level argument. Okay, so why don't you explain it to us other than making a claim? I didn't make a claim. I said that the first part of the argument is reductio, a retorsion argument, showing the absurdity of that worldview. And then the second part of the argument is to show and argue that only the Orthodox Christian metaphysic, epistemology, and ethic can ground the transcendental categories that are the preconditions for any possible knowledge. Okay, so there's two parts to it, Jay. Let's deal right. with the first part. Does the first part alone give justification for the claim that the orthodox theological positions are the only justification for the preconditions of intelligibility and all the other transcendental categories? No, all retorsion shows is that the other position is absurd. Okay, so it only shows that that position is absurd. So mm -hmm. that doesn't justify it. So the second part is, is positing the orthodox position. But that's right. the very thing that we're asking for what is right. the justification for the claim that the orthodox position alone justifies the preconditions of intelligibility? Correct. So what is it? You're just restating the claim. You're not giving an argument. No, it's a, you're confusing a first order argument with a meta level argument. It's a category error. You keep saying I'm confusing and you're making right. claims, but then you're never giving any content to your claim. I just stated the content. You just don't understand it. No, I know. I do understand what you're saying. Okay, you what, just said, you just said. Then you should understand what a meta level a meta, argument is. You just said it's a meta right. level argument. Right. And I see here from your good friend, Anias, right? right? Father Deacon Anias, which I've read his paper and was very interesting, actually. Too bad you didn't uh, understand it. Yeah, too bad I didn't understand it. I mean, it was so terrible. He contradicts himself up and down on the same page. And he explicitly says that the tag argument to ask for a justification for positing the orthodox yeah. view is wrongheaded because it's prior to epistemology right. and argument. It's wrongheaded in the first order of reasoning. Okay, so then there is That's no my point. There is no justification no. by by the criterion. No, the by criterion, first order reasoning. By the criterion problem you were You're asking. Not by the criterion problem you were asking me about. Do you have a justification for the claim that the Eastern Orthodox position alone suffices for the grounding transcendentals? Mm -hmm. Do you have a justification that meets the, the criterion of justification yeah. that you're asking? The first part is the absurdity of your worldview in our case, in this debate. And the second part is the coherence and the grounding work that the Orthodox Christian worldview does for things like universals, laws of logic, objective ethics, uh, identity over time. All those metaphysical pr uh, principles make sense in a world that's uh, where God is the creator. Okay, Jay, which is exactly what I said. So, uh, Jay, and the problem of orthodoxy in orthodoxy argument, does Alan Siegel, from your reading of his two powers in heaven, does he say that the two powers in heaven view is heretical? Yeah. Okay. Do Siegel and Boyorin consider the two powers in heaven view akin to Logos theology? Uh, they relate. I don't know if they'd be akin. Okay, they relate it. So, um, is Logos because theology... Because it goes back to Philo. Is, yeah. Is Logos theology heretical according to Orthodox Christianity, meaning the theology of Philo? Is that heretical? Yeah, Philo's position would be binatarian. Okay. According to Boyorin, John Baer, and the Catholic Encyclopedia, was Justin Martyr a proponent of Logos theology or Orthodox Trinitarianism? Uh, I think that Justin had a form of Logos uh, theology and Trinitarianism. Okay. Is Justin Martyr a saint in the Orthodox Church? He is, and I we address this in the uh, Inspiring Philosophy stream, all of your arguments. Is it permissible to pray to him? Uh, we ask for his intercession. Okay. So when he declares that Jesus is another God and says that the Son is a product of the Father's will, are those heretical positions? 
Uh, there's a there might be a lack of clarity there, but we already addressed this in the inspiring philosophy uh, stream. Is it heretical to believe that the son is a product of the father's will? Uh, there's probably some lack of clarity there if if it, that's uh, an authentic text. Yeah. Is it heretical to believe that the son is a product of the father's will? Yeah. Uh, if if he means it in that sense, we would say it's wrong. Okay. Is it heretical? It could be. Okay. So it's permissible to pray to uh, heretical saints, correct? Well, we don't automatically think that if somebody got something wrong, they're necessarily a heretic. I okay, mean, Augustine, he, he, made, he, he um, Augustine made many mistakes. Too. Many heresies? Well, a heresy is decided he to be He believed in the filioque, doctrine. right? Augustine believed in the filioque, right? Correct. Is that heresy? When it becomes known as a heresy, yes. Okay, so now it would be heretical to believe in that. That's what councils are for, correct. Okay, thank you very much. So um, do ethities believe in divine simplicity, Jay? Uh, I don't remember. You don't know if you don't know if we believe in divine simplicity. Well, you say that not in the sense of absolute divine simplicity. Are we occasionalists? Some. Is Ibn Taymiyyah an occasionalist? Ibn Taymiyyah's position seems to be that uh, created causes actually happen, uh, but God can also reverse them. Uh, but he doesn't seem to affirm a strict occasionalism. Okay, so is he an occasionalist or not? You don't know? I just answered that. Does he believe in secondary causality? Uh, he says that they're not uh, necessary, but God can change them. Does he believe in secondary causality? It's a basic term. I just answered that. Yes or no? Does he believe in secondary causality? I just answered it, dude. You didn't answer it. I did. Does he believe in secondary you, causality? You want me to read you his position from the book? I just asked you, does he believe in secondary causality? It's a yes or no question. I'll give you a chance to respond, Jay. We've run out of that seven minutes. Okay, yeah, no problem. Yeah, the best of my understanding of his position is that he thinks that there is uh, there is real causality in the world. It's not. Uh, it doesn't operate apart from God's will. And that if God wills to, he can do a miracle or do something differently. So I'm on, I mean, I, I couldn't figure out what exactly his position is because I think it's a bunch of contradictions. So uh, what's up next? Are we doing? This will be seven minutes of you interrogating Jake, and then we'll go into the closings before the Q&A. All right. So you, you seem to have a problem with uh, the idea of uh, reductios and internal critiques and uh, meta logic. Uh, I'm not sure why this would be a problem for you, given that you're named the Muslim meta physician. I don't have a you problem. Know, do you know what meta logic is? I don't have a problem with the critique. You don't have a problem with the transcendental argument? No. I have a problem with your use of it. <laughs> okay. You if know, you've seen my if you've seen my okay. debate on this channel, I, I don't watch all your one. debates. No, I, I don't you, it, exactly. I, it puts I've me used, to sleep. I can't listen I've, to. I've, I've used a form. Of I put you on four often. times to listen to, and it's still unbearable. So, okay, uh, exactly. what I'm trying to figure out is, hard though, on you, you know what metalogic up. is? No, tell me what's metalogic, Jay. I have no idea what it is. Well, that no answer, idea. that condescending answer, is like you do know. I have no idea what metalogic is. Okay. Yeah, tell me. I have no idea. So it's uh the questioning of how logic itself works, right? Okay, good. So is it invalid to speak of metalogical argumentation? No. Okay. But your critique, for example, of the way that uh, Father Deacon Ananias argued in that paper was that he was contradicting himself because he argued that there's no justification for transcendental arguments in a orthodox sense of not the first order or first order argumentation, first order logic. He's talking about meta level argumentation. Um, was that a question? So what I'm asking you is that why do you have a problem with it if it's too if you if you understood that it's a meta level argument? Okay, my problem with Father Deacon Ananias, um, when a problem with what he said in the paper is that he makes the claim and he seems to make the claim that it's a metalogical problem or a metalogical argument. Sorry, right. and therefore it it would make no sense to ask for justification or argumentation because it's prior to argumentation. 
That's what. Yeah, but that's still a form of. There's still you can still justify it. It just becomes a paradigm level justification. Yeah, I understand that, but that's not what my criticism is. My criticism is that then later in the paper he seemingly does try to justify it when he says and he talks about which I I gave the quote. I don't want to waste your time. Where he says, "For only in the orthodox doctrine of God we will see that God is the necessary condition, Mm -hmm. is rational, omniscient, transcendent, and so on and so forth." That was what I was giving. He starts giving all of those reasons, right. which is the exact same thing that I would do. So what's the problem? Well, you have a different metaphysic, as as I pointed out in my opening statement and in the critiques about your ideas of self-evident truths. So yeah. you have a different metaphysic. I agree with that. But then it comes down to, don't you agree that then it comes down to the difference in our metaphysics, which are the debates? We That's what we're supposed to be. Yeah, debating. but your starting point was self-evident truths of reason. I know that you claim that you also uh, start with the direct perception or intuitive, whatever sense that you have of Allah. Do you think I'm lying about that? Huh? Do you think I'm lying? No, but I'm saying that it bypasses and ignores the question of the first principles of natural theology or reasoning, which you're committed to. Yeah, but I thought that you as an Orthodox believe that the noose in the same manner is a legitimate thing to appeal to. That's a two-quote way. way. It's a two-quote way. No, it's not. It's it saying is. that, no, it's not. It's saying that because of the same fact that we are d- debating metaphysics, yeah, but I, I have I, a similar position yeah, the when it comes though, to that difference, though, right, point. but the, the difference is that in letter 234 of Basil, which was my closing statement, which I had to yeah. rush through, if people want to go back, they can screenshot it. I noted the argument that the energies come down to us, and that's why we have a basis for uh, affirmation or what we call cataphatic affirmation. Uh, uh, I believe naming. in the same thing. What? What's the yeah, but my, that's why my whole argument this time was that when you try to do the naming, when uh, Ibn Tamiya, for example, explains in what sense there is similarity or likeness or resemblance, he says that it is uh, not like the created mode of, of being. So it actually tells us nothing. So your naming tells us nothing because you don't have an energy's doctrine that comes down to us. That was the argument. I do. We do have the same doctrine in terms. No, you don't. The, yes, we do. In terms of the energies coming down, when an energy comes down, does it attach to a human being? It has nothing to do with attaching. It has to do with how we predicate. That's the argument here. No, so, and, and, yeah, so well, what does it mean? That's why I asked you about the foot, and I asked you if a god foot is un, uh, nothing like a human foot. What does it tell us? What's the meaning that is, that's given us there? In the same way that when I say that this paper has whiteness, that is nothing like the whiteness in your forehead. So you're still I using still, paper. Still, a paper's a created I thing. I still understand okay? it. In the These same are creatures. Way. These are creatures. Yeah, they're creatures. And we believe that. So, they, so the, is, another creature which is totally unlike Allah, tells us nothing about all. So these names and these predicates aren't telling us anything. Is the no, point. no, you're saying, no, I'm giving you an argument to show you how they Your are argument refers to something. another creature. No, you're, I'm giving you an argument to show. It referred to another creature. That nominalist, it refers to another nom- creature. That's what's in question. Nominalist predication is yeah, not meaningless. Yeah, exactly. It's not meaningless. Nominalist predication is not meaningless. It's circular. That's the point. It's arbitrary. Because you're just using another created object to try to explain what is beyond the created. That's the whole point of the argument. That's what I've been arguing this whole time. And that's why your position contradicts, because on the one hand, the uncreated foot is nothing like the human created foot. But you say, oh, but it actually kind of is. But we don't know the meaning of that. So it's no, we do know the meaning. Anything. We do know the meaning. Again, you're misrepresenting. No, my Ibn Tamiya says you're both mi- things. You're mis- oh. Ibn Tamiya says you're both misrepres- things that we don't. He what? says that it's like it. We don't know the meaning. He doesn't say that. Yes, he does. He doesn't say, say we don't know the meaning. Yes, he does. Where? Give the give the evidence that we don't know the meaning of what? Because when one, he no the the left. God foot, you know what I mean. Show that he says we don't know the meaning. Where does he say we don't yeah, know the what meaning? He, okay, what he says is that what it means is that it exists in a manner befitting Allah. That tells us nothing. Oh, it does? So when your Orthodox Church says the exact same thing, what does that mean? We don't say that. We don't, don't say, say that. that? God doesn't have an uncreated you, foot. I mean, he, he doesn't say in a God be... Your Orthodox Church doesn't talk about a God befitting manner? Not a God befitting foot. Does it talk about a God What is befitting, a God befitting foot, does Jake? It talk about a God... Jake, it's, I'm asking does, you. Does it talk Jake, about a God what is befitting... A, I'm asking you. What is a God a befitting foot? The same way that it's described in the text. That so no answer, no. Which in the is, same which way a, that which is a circle. In the same way so that it tells it's us described nothing. In the so and how is it described? So revelation doesn't tell us anything when we read it. No, it doesn't I'm asking mean your anything? view. Of course, revelation means things when we read which the words. Is what? 
Which so, is what? Uh, that so, you're, God, so you're telling me nothing. That God describes. You're telling me nothing. God describes what his hands and feet actually do. And when it's he, what? So you have no idea. You haven't even read our No, text. I want you to tell me. You said it's creating Adam, but that's another created thing. I'll give no, you a not. chance to answer. Adam is not a created thing. I'll give you a chance his, to answer, his Jake. Smells and and burn, dude. His, hands, his hands are not created. Neither is his foot. What is an is, uncreated I'm, hand? He, he said he's going to give me a chance what to respond. What is an uncreated hand? Jake, I've got a, Jake, let's, your time is up. Your time is ahead, up. Jake. Let me respond, and then you we can move on. An uncreated hand, in like manner, <laughs> an uncreated essence, has nothing in common. You have not shown that simply using the same word entails that there is similarity, and I've explained what an uncreated hand is. It is that by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can grasp things, that he can create Adam with his own two hands. That's a created exactly. thing. No, For it's creatures. not. Those are creatures. Hands yeah, are creatures. And, and so is God's knowledge. God's knowledge is created. God's too. knowledge is a creature? Yeah, we'll that's what you believe, me. right? God's we'll go to the right? closing. <laughs> about your position. We have <laughs> seven fool, minute closing. <laughs> I don't even understand basic arguments. <laughs> seven minute closing. So what I you're earlier, so mad, I dude. You're so mad. <laughs> no, I got I'm the not order. mad at all. You got all right, gentlemen. Destroyed. We gotta. We've this one. I earlier I got the order wrong. So it's actually that the closings will be just as you expected. Namely, Jake will go first. Then Jay. We'll go for his closing, and then we'll go into the Q&A. So we have seven minutes. The clock is set for you, Jake. The floor is all yours for your seven-minute closing statement. Okay, one second. Okay, ready. Here we go. All right, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Hamabad. Well, it's been an interesting debate, I can say that. But Jay, as we've seen, he doesn't understand basic ethity aqidah. He couldn't answer whether clearly Ibn Taymiyyah is an occasionalist. I've got a book over here, which I can, I can, I don't mind actually sending it to Jay for free, where he completely refutes occasionalism. We do believe in secondary causation, Jay. So I guess you don't know that. He didn't know the basic difference. I didn't between, say that he was an occasionalist. You're not allowed to speak. I didn't say that. You're lying. You I, I do want to, just to... I'll give you a chance to, in your closing as well, to rebut Jake. But I do want to, just for the closing statements, I want to keep it. Yeah, I know it's separate. hard, Jay. You're getting refused. But I, Just I didn't chill say out. That. Just chill out. All right. We're ready, James, to restart? Uh, let's see. I'll give you six minutes and 20 seconds left. Okay, good. Here we go. So Jake can't keep quiet because he knows that he's being made a fool. And he did it to himself. He doesn't know the basic difference between tefweed and nana and tefweed al kefiya. This is basic, and he says, oh, well, your God is just a God of the Arabs? No, but if you read our literature in the same way that I know the difference between usia, and, which is essence, and I understand the term homoousion, I don't speak Greek, I don't speak Latin, but I understand these terms because I've read several dozen books on the subject to be acquainted with the terms. But you haven't, and that's why you look like an ignorant buffoon, because you don't know the basic difference. And that's why you're mocking right now, because it's hard on you. Everybody can see how this debate went for you, Jay. It looked really pathetic. Now, going back to the point, he didn't understand that we believe in secondary causation, that Ibn Taymiyyah was an occasionalist. Yeah, he didn't give a clear option. He said, oh, he's contradictory. He doesn't understand. And also, he doesn't, as I said, understand a dif basic difference between tefweed al-nana and tefweed al kefiya which is very basic. Okay, there are many things. He didn't even know what the fitra was, which is very basic to our epistemology. How are you going to critique our epistemology and you don't even know what the fitra is? It's a complete joke. Now, in terms of my arguments, he didn't respond really to any of them. On my first argument, the LPT, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit's God, and they're not each other. They're distinct from each other the same way that we count, Jay. Let me help you out. One plus one plus one does not equal one, sir. It equals three. So the Muslim meme has been vindicated. Thank you very much, Jay. And his only response is, oh, we count different things in different ways. And I asked you for an objective criteria of why we count attributes or energies and persons by identity, and we count gods by division other than an ad hoc unprincipled assertion. And you had no answer to that whatsoever, sir. You'd had no answer. Yeah, keep shaking your head. And then you claimed, 
oh, you claimed Jake actually counts by division. And then when I questioned you about how I count by division in the cross-examination section, you flopped so hard. I don't count by division. We count the attributes by identity, by the fact even though they're inseparable and not divided, they still count as more than one. That means we're counting them by identity, not by division. So you haven't shown that I've counted by division within God whatsoever. The only thing you have is an unprincipled way of avoiding saying that there are three gods because you just don't want to admit that you're a polytheist, which everybody knows that you are, including the Roman Orthodox, the sorry, Roman Catholics. Now, here we go to Jay's point here where he's refuted by the Roman Catholics, right? Here we go. Branson, uh, uh, yeah, again, <laughs> refuted him on the claim that Branson himself says that Gregory of Nyssa believes that the essence of God, the divine essence, is universal. Jay, in his, one of his videos, he says, we apply that same idea to the Trinity, which is that each of the uh, hypostases instantiates the divine nature. So they are instantiations of the divine nature. Now, Jay, don't get out of, don't get out of wrestled out of your seat now. I know they're not merely instantiations, but they do instantiate the divine essence. Nevertheless, Timothy Paul, Catholic philosopher, says about the instantiation view, there are, there are at least two problems with Jay Dyer's Eastern Orthodox instantiation view. This is the critique from the Catholics who believe they're polytheists, that the instantiation view has to face an answer to why the person nature question, both having to do with the conciliar claim that there is only one God. First, consider a problem often raised against social Trinitarianism, a type of instantiation view that builds into the unity of God much more than mere instantiation. The problem goes as follows. The instantiation view gives up monotheism. When we count human people, Jay, just like I asked you how many people are on the screen, which your own church father would have said one, which is ridiculous, we count by individual instances of humanity. When my da daughters, Mary, Beatrice, Edith, Agnes, each instantiate the universal humanity and each has a proper characteristic such that we don't confuse them, what we have there are four humans, not a single human like Gregory of Nyssa says. So likewise, on the instantiation count, we ought to invert the line from the Athanasius Creed saying instead that there is not one God, but three gods. Think about it another way. Christians wanted to safeguard the monotheism that they inherited from Judaism. Whether they succeeded is a separate question. Now, suppose a Jewish man were accused of polytheism. Here's a defense he could give on this instantiation view of the divine nature. He could say, yes, it is true. I worship the God of Israel, Baal of the Canaanites, Dagon of the Philistines, and countless others. But fear not. I only countenance a single universal divinity, which each of my many gods instantiates. As such, I'm still a monotheist. I don't think Moses would be impressed, Jay. This is what Timothy Paul is saying, that you're clearly just a polytheist. Now, what does Jay say about the Catholic view? He rightly points out that it reduces to modalism. And I agree. That's why the Catholic view is modalism. The Eastern Orthodox view is polytheism. They say that the truth is in between, but they're never able to extend, uh, explain that properly. Jay says I equivocated on power, but he doesn't believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have the same abilities. He couldn't give an even answer if the Father has the ability or power to become incarnate because he knew that would result in them not having the same powers in which they wouldn't be the same God. Thomas Aquinas criticizes that view in the Summa in part three. And last but not least, Jay was not able to actually deal with the Ethari Akhida, and it's because he hasn't even read our texts. Before the debate, he needed to delay it. So people were wondering what the delay was. It was because of him, he wasn't able to read an English translation of an unreleased book. And that's why he doesn't understand our position. Thank you very much. That will kick it over to Jay for his 10 minute closing as well. Wanna get wanna say, folks, if you haven't yet, check out the poll in the live chat. You can vote on where you stand on this question tonight. Already has 2,754 votes. So log in right now in the live chat. You can put your vote in the poll. With that, Jay, the floor is all yours. I hope Jake's okay because the whole debate, he's basically been spurging and uh, squ squirming like something's wrong over there. I've just got Parkinson's or what's going on, but I hope he's okay. I didn't mean to hurt him so bad or hurt his feelings. Uh, I love you, Jake, man. Uh, 
Yeah, I think that, first of all, as I pointed out, when he asked me about Ibn Tamiya, I was clearly trying to remember exactly what his position was from the Suleiman book. And I specifically said that he allows for created causation. Jake then tried to make me sound like I was saying that he was an occasionalist. I never said that. So that was a complete dishonest lie. Uh, I said that he believes that there's real causation in the world, but he also thinks that God can intervene and do miracles. So that was a straight up lie. Uh, just looking for anything, grasping at straws because he performed so badly. It's probably why he had to mute uh, or take off his camera. I don't know if he's uh, running to the bathroom to take a comfort break or, or what's going on. But yeah, I think if we review this debate, we'll notice that the central issues that were in question, two ways of accounting for uh, unity and multiplicity, as I pointed out in my opening statement, not a question of who's the true monotheist versus the polytheist, the way that Jake wanted to uh, characterize the debate. Because if you go watch, for example, Jake's debate with Dr. Bo Branson or his debate with Dr. Khalil, you'll notice that Jake consistently had no real way to answer for the actual questions of how we account for multiplicity and unity in his conception of the attributes and the essence. I specifically gave numerous arguments in the opening statement that Jake never got anywhere near touching. He says, I didn't make any arguments. I did. I made countless arguments throughout that uh, opening statement. I specifically pointed out that not that Jake only counts in one way. I said that when he uses the terminology of inseparability, that he's using the idea of counting by division. And it's simply saying that if you say, for example, that the attributes are uh, undivided or that the uh, essence is one and undivided, that's also counting by division. That's how the ancient and medieval world typically thought, unless they were dealing with objects of first order imposition or objects of second order imposition. Again, I addressed those dis disputes when I covered that topic. So most of the stuff that uh, Jake has pointed to, um, I've, I did address. He just then came on and said, he never addressed nothing I said. No, I did address everything that you said. Just most of what I addressed, you just weren't familiar with or you didn't know what these topics were. Now, again, in the topic of the universal, for us, <clears throat> as universals get discussed amongst the Cappadocians and then post-Chalcedon, it becomes more and more specified and more and more clarified. So if you just ask me something like, is God's essence a universal? It really depends on what time frame we're talking about. But post-Cappadocians, uh, uh, post uh, Chalcedon and so forth, we don't usually see the idea of a universal itself in the Platonic sense being attributed to the divine essence. It's simply said to be something common. So we can say that, yeah, the divine essence is common, but universals take on a specific category of a created thing, especially in, say, Maximus. Maximus, for example, argues that universals can perish, and this is in the Tolison uh, dissertation. Well, obviously, universals aren't the divine essence uh, because the divine essence can't perish. Uh, and if universals can perish, then universals are created things. Now, universals are patterned on things in the divine mind. We would call those the divine ideas, but that's a different topic. But suffice to say, it's, again, another kind of equivocation uh, with how the Cappadocians use the term common or universal versus the way that it's used by the time of St. John of Damascus in a more precise way about created realities. So <clears throat> the universals dispute, however, is very important for this debate because, as we saw, Jake's denial of universals results in a lot of problems for accounting for things like meaning and identity over time. That's why I kept stressing how would Jake understand various texts of the Quran. And you'll notice when we got into the, the nitty gritty of the epistemology, Jake completely collapsed. Jake went in circles. He was lost. He didn't know what was going on, where he was even at. He thought that uh, you could say that, well, some things are self-evident. What you notice when I first asked him, he didn't want to say it was self-evident. Uh, about a minute or two later, yeah, these are self-evident truths. Uh, but then he, when I asked him about the criterion problem, which is, how do we know the self-evident versus the non-self-evident? He again appealed to a self-referential thing because we know because of the way that we go about doing it. Yeah, but that doesn't justify the claim. And he knows that it doesn't. And that's why he went deeper into deflecting over into transcendental argumentation and justification. And he didn't know what a metallurgical uh, uh, argument was, even though he admits that that uh, FDA was making a metallurgical argumentation in the paper. The paper is just arguing that the transcendental argument isn't justified in the exact same way that first order types of beliefs are justified. 
So, and this is just to say that different things are argued for in different ways. If you watch my Matt Dillahunty debate, this becomes a, a, a very central point of dispute between us where Matt thinks that everything is argued for in one way. Likewise, that very low tier uh, quality of debate that Jake shares with uh, Matt Dillamonkey, they both just seem to think that words mean one thing. Uh, all arguments are argued in the same way. Uh, justification happens in one way. Different types of things are proven and argued for in different ways. Different types of things are counted in different ways. So I made this very clear. Uh, again, Jake didn't get any of that. And everything had to be smushed down and reduced into one simple, one-dimensional ways of understanding everything throughout this debate. So I think that if, if people paid attention, especially when we got to the notion of hand, foot, uh, the, the bodily properties that are ascribed to Allah in his school, in his tradition, Jake couldn't tell us what uh, an uncreated foot is that doesn't bear similarity to foot, except that it's similar in the case of functionality of creating. Okay, but the creating that you talk about or the piece of paper that you referred to or this or that, those are other created things. And so the created things that you keep appealing to never match up or touch upon the uncreated thing, which the Quran says is unlike, right? Allah is seconds. absolutely unlike creatures. What's that? 50 seconds. So the argument is not that Jake believes or Ibn Tamiya believes that there's no way to have positive predication. The argument is that they contradict and Suleiman points out numerous places where actually he contradicts. So uh, Jake says, oh, he didn't read it. I was just waiting for a good book on this topic to have a good debate. So Jake's trying to make it like I was, uh, you know, avoiding something or whatever. No, no, no. I just wanted to have a good debate. And I went to the trouble of reading this 400 page book for you to have a good discussion and a good debate. And uh, <clears throat> again, Suleiman, page 331 notes that. He absolutely contradicts himself on this point. He also contradicts on this notion of what the divine perfections are, right? And so when we're told that we are supposed to know what a hand is, every Jew or Christian in the 7th or 8th century would know what a hand is by empirically based hands. End time. With that, we're going to go into the q and want to say, folks, we're going to try to move through this as fast as humanly possible couple of quick things one is the goal is what we have written down here is 30 minutes as well as we will not read super chats that are just attacks on people we do want actual sincere questions also as we had mentioned earlier in the debate and as you can probably see at the bottom right of your screen we're only going to read super chats that are five dollars or more we're going to try to get to standard questions namely when you just tag me in the chat with a question uh but I just can't make any promises because we do, we agree to a 30 minute Q&A. So I want to go through this as fast as humanly possible. Thanks for your patience. And here we go. First up, thanks very much. Jean Michael B says, Jake says that we are polytheists. Does he know he follows a pagan God named La? I'll give you a chance <laughs> to respond to that, Jake. I have a feeling you disagree. Yeah, I don't know where he's getting this uh, pagan god concept of, of law. In fact, um, even Orthodox Christians, I think, Jay, maybe this is something that we could agree on. Orthodox Christians that are actually Arabs uh, <coughs> call, call God Allah. So <laughs> if, if you think that that's the case, then Jay is just as much of a pagan and Orthodox are for using the term Allah. So it's completely ridiculous. Question for Jake. They say, how does Allah, who is above the seven heavens, descend to the lowest heaven? Does he have temporal space? I don't know what temporal space means because uh, that time and space are two different things, at least in my understanding, unless you take a, uh, a modern physical understanding where time and space are the same thing. So I don't even really understand the question. But when you ask how... That shows that the questioner doesn't understand because we don't say that we know the how or the kefia. We don't know the kefia of the attribute. So, and it's not only for descent or nazul, it's the same for yed or huwa or any of the attributes. We don't talk about the howness of the attribute. 
Last disclaimer, folks, we have so many questions. Please don't submit any more questions. We're going to try to move fast. Joshua DeKing says, believe whatever you want. Allah has eternal attributes that require a recipient. Therefore, he's dependent upon other than himself to express himself. Who's that for? Yeah, this is, that's just a statement. But, I mean, okay, we don't believe that. We don't believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how is he, if he's dependent upon his attributes, Let's say for the sake of argument, he's dependent upon his attributes. How is he dependent upon somebody else? They're his attributes. So, I mean, that just makes no sense. It's the same. It would be a similar concept in orthodoxy to say, oh, God has attributes. So he's dependent upon somebody else. Well, the attributes are his. It's just a, such a low level critique. This one from Golsi Tabard says, Allah and Yahweh are both the, that's, they're just trolling. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. This one is from, I'm sorry, my screen's reloading on me. Yeshua the King says, why does the Quran say it's clear, detailed, and explains everything, yet Muslims differ on Allah and the Quran doesn't detail the kaifia slash howness? Let me know if I pronounced it wrong. Yeah, yeah no, no, it's okay. Um, so he's saying, why does the Quran say it's a detailed explanation of all things? That's in chapter 12, verse 111, when it says, Tefsi le uh, But if you see this phrase used, it's obviously used in a hyperbolic manner because it's used in the same sense when it talks about what was revealed to Moses. Uh, it, he was also revealed a detailed explanation of all things. And yet we believe the Quran came afterwards and revealed things that were not given to Moses. So it's just a misunderstanding of the phrase. This one coming in from Dr. Chillin says, Hey Jake, two-part question. Is LGBT allowed in Islam? Because in Sana Sana Nabi, Dawud 5224, Muhammad was kissing. Uh, let's see. They say allegedly Muhammad was kissing uh, another man on the chest. They say, should we stone him? I would have to look at the hadith. I don't know what he's referring to. Uh, but LGBTQ. I, don't, I mean, I don't want to get the stream banned or anything, but no, we believe it's a we believe it's a sin, uh, uh, similar to Orthodox. So we're actually in agreement on that perspective that LGBTQ is a sin. This one from Famo says, Jay, your entire open was a failed attempt at trying to challenge Tahid. Yet once, uh, not once, did you attempt to prove the blatant paradox known as the Trinity. Well, again, uh, in my last statement, I addressed the chief argument that uh, Jake relies on the LPT. And I just simply pointed out that there's two different ways that uh, counting happens uh, for different things. Different things are counted in different ways. And that's why, um, you know, if you want a fuller presentation of explaining and arguing the Trinitarian doctrine itself, uh, you know, I gave a lot of those passages in the beginning part of the Daniel debate. But I was just trying to squeeze as much in as possible. But I would also add that uh, I would say that if Jake, you know, as he pointed out, wants to just count by identity, if uh, he thinks God is necessary and he counts by identity, and if we follow the rules of Tamiya, that each of the uh, what's true of one of the attributes is also true of the essence and so forth, then he's got multiple necessary beings if he's got multiple attributes. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate it. Even Lord says, Jay, are Mormons basically Muslims? And Jake, as a Muslim, well, we'll first we'll give you a chance to respond, Jay. Are Mormons basically Muslims? And there's some interesting parallels between um, the supposed uh, prophet status of Muhammad and the supposed prophet status of, uh, you know, Joseph Smith in terms of, you know, polygamy or um, direct uh, new revelations that sort of contradict previous revelations. See my argument with uh, Daniel Hakikachu. But I also I would argue that, uh, you know, Islam is mainly focused on trying to explain through thousands of pages of debates what Allah's unity and singleness actually is, whereas Mormons are actually tritheists and believe in three uh, distinct, discrete gods. You got actually it. I believe in a lot more than three gods, but yeah. They say for Jake, as a Muslim, what are your thoughts of Mormons compared to other Christians and Protestant groups? Yeah, Mormons, uh, I agree with Jay's part about Mormonism. Uh, I don't think it's anything similar to Islam. 
Uh, but Mormons are actually some of the biggest polytheists in the world because they believe Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At least I say they're a bit more honest than Jay because they admit they're three gods. But then they go much further than that by saying that man can become God one day and not in the sense that Jay talks about with theosis. They go much further than that because they believe Father, Son, and Holy Spirit used to not be gods and they elevated to that station of God. So they're actually one of the biggest polytheists in the world as a religion. You got it. This one from Bo Branson says, Jake quotes me saying <laughs> Trinitarianism, quote unquote, seems like saying one plus one plus one equals one, not that it is. He omits that I next put Gregory of Nyssa's response in standard predicate logic, giving a formal consistency proof. Yeah. So uh, to be clear, I wouldn't be so stupid to claim that Bo Branson actually explicitly says that the Trinity is like one plus one plus one equals one. That's not the point. The point is that the original problem, I was using the quote to explain how he understands what the LPT is. And we can agree, I think Jay and I, if we agree about anything, the difference in, in terms of why I say the Trinity results in three gods is about counting. So that's the only point of the quote. It's not to say that Branson <laughs> believes that uh, the LPT is successful or he believes in three gods. That would be ridiculous. It's just to show that he's explaining what the problem is supposed to be. And then, of course, in his dissertation, he attempts to ex you know, respond to the problem. This one coming in from Even Lord says, Jay, oh, we got that one. XXWLZXX says, question for Jake. Do you believe the eyes are... All right, this is weird. This Bo Branson says, if there should turn out to be any problem with the doctrine of the Trinity at all, it will not be one of mere logical inconsistency in saying that, quote, these three are one, unquote. I mean, that's just a claim, but I've given an argument for the LPT. And the same uh, argument that I gave um, to Branson is the same one I gave to Jay and Branson, even in his new book, because I've spoke to other contributors to the new book, which has been not been published yet. He never responds to my cre critique of the unprincipled ad hoc manner in which they count persons and attributes or energies by identity, but they count gods by division. He has no explanation for that. Well, of course, that was explained multiple times tonight. It's explained by Dr. Branson in many places. Uh, and uh, I addressed it by first and second order imposition argumentation, as well as showing that multiple theologians, even Al-Ghazali, count by division. I don't mind Jay responding, but if he's going to respond, then I'd like to respond to other questions. I'll give, I can asked. give you the last word, Jay. Well, I mean, I, Jake said like No, 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 I'm not, saying, I'm not saying to respond now to what he said. I'm just saying... Jay has answered other questions that I would have wanted to respond to, but I was quiet. So, so I, well, let me ask a question about that in terms of the moderator. Like, so does the other person get to respond to Like if a question goes to Jake, is it just to Jake or how's this going to work? I don't know. That's why I'm trying to. Well, I'm asking the moderator. What, what normally do you want to We Normally, this is something that I, I'm happy to have your guys' creative input on. Uh, tonight, I would, I think it's best just because we want to get through as many questions as possible. Okay. We'll yeah. have 30 minutes for the Q&A. That's fine. This one from Mahir84 says the Messiah, in parentheses, whose name wasn't Jesus, didn't know the hour. When did the Holy Spirit relinquish power to not have the same knowledge as the Father? Emphasis on Father. I think that's for you, Jay. Is that to me? Yeah, if you read uh, Basil letter 235 uh, and 6, I think. Uh, 234, 5 and 6. 34 is the energies and then 5 and 6 addresses this topic where... It's just a use of uh, uh, rhetorical, exaggerative language, which Jesus does quite a bit. For example, he says, there's none good but God. But then we have other places where he says, of course, uh, there's a, you know, this person is the good man. Uh, you know, the Bible calls Jesus good, the Holy Spirit good. So it's a rhetorical device to say that not even I know, right? Or not even the son knows. It doesn't literally mean that he doesn't know because we're also told that Jesus knows all things. This one from Sauer says, is the Trinity a necessary truth or contingent truth? If the former, what is the contradiction of rejecting it? If a contradiction isn't shown from denial, it's a contingent truth. Therefore, Trinity false. I'm assuming that's to me, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think that um, 
this is uh, if this is like the atheist TikTok people that ask this question, this is, again, kind of making the mistake of thinking that the argument, the transcendental argument is a first order argument. It's a meta level argument. So uh, that's not really relevant to how we are. We argue tag. This one from FCLA News says Allah. I, I know I'm going to say this wrong. So help me. Uh, Alu yeah. Akbar. Yeah. Am I saying this right? Yeah. This one Allah from Akbar, yeah. LH says Jake, the meta. Yeah, got that. One. <laughs> Central Dawa says Jay Dyer saying, quote, Jake doesn't understand, unquote, is not an argument against Jake. Make an actual argument. Let's give you a chance, Jay, to respond to that. Well, I mean, I might have used that phrase at a couple points in the debate, but I didn't rely only on saying Jake doesn't understand. I think I used that phrase two or three times, but uh, I gave many arguments. You got it. Let's see this one from LH says so there's one Allah with multiple body parts, i.e., the hands are distinct from the shin. Complete partiality of Allah, they put in all caps. No, we don't believe that Allah's yed is a body part. We don't believe that he has any body parts. And Jay should know this. I'm not saying he's claiming that, but from reading the text, we don't believe that they're body parts. So by people keep asserting this same uh, falsehood, which Farid Suleiman uh, refutes directly in the book, um, just shows their own ignorance, but they can do it as long as they like. This one coming in from Dalil says, Jake, why do you worship 99 gods? I'll give you a chance to respond to that. I don't worship 99 gods because I don't say that the sifat or the sifa, which is an attribute, is a god. Just as J. Dyer does not say that the energy of God's will or power or knowledge are gods. We don't call them gods. They're attributes of God. Famo says, J., if the sun wanted a tree to be yellow, the Holy Spirit wanted it to be orange, and at the same time the Father wanted it to be blue— what color would the tree be? Yeah, we don't believe in uh, that will and uh, intentionality and action are uh, themselves personal properties. So the Trinity shares a common will, a common nature, and common operations. And so there wouldn't be conflicting contrary wills within God. That's the, the traits or properties of nature. And then when we talk about the mode in which that nature exists, it exists in the mode of three persons that have it. So it's both uh, particularized and it's common at the same time. So I'm coming in from L2A says, did a natural theist really just try to hijack the anthropology of the noose without an energy essence distinction? I think that's to me. And I would say that, uh, I mean, I, I, I understand, I guess, the apologetic use of trying to um, utilize the notion of the noose, but I don't think that translates into the uh, Tawhid theology that he has in any coherent way. You got it. Thank you very much for this question. Ecclesiastes says, Jake, why would you debate? Let's see. Um, this one from Punk Giver says, For Jake, if the sun cannot cause another person, can Allah's foot cause another Allah's hand? I mean, it's just a ridiculous question. It's not even worth responding to. Ecclesiastes says, great job, Jay Dyer. They say, Jay, uh, or they say, uh, Jake, would you debate David Wood? Uh, depends on the topic. This one from <laughs> Doman says, is the sun a S-E? Uh, if yes, how is that possible since he's begotten? And if no, how is he God? Because it's greater to be a S-E. And God is maximally great. I think he means ase, but I'm sure Jay got that. Yeah, aseity is uh, for us a property that picks out the Father. And so, as you, if you can go watch the uh, debate between Jake and uh, Dr. Bo Branson, that whole debate settles this question because we could say, for example, that all fathers are human beings, but anything that's not a father is not a human, right? This ends up in certain fallacies like denying the antecedent. And if you watch that debate, Jake's guilty of denying the antecedent. You got it. This one from the Chelskian says, Jake, does your back hurt? Okay, that's weird. Abraham Velasco. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I don't get to vet all these. They say, it actually doesn't. I'm sitting quite comfortably, but yeah. <laughs> they say, what is the point in Allah using the created term hand or foot, etc., 
yet is nothing like a created hand, foot, etc. Yeah, it's it's something very basic that I've explained numerous times, and it seemed that Jay himself didn't get it. When you say that these are created things, all of the predicates that we use in the English language or in Arabic, when we say essence, or we say power, or we say hand, there is no difference in terms of predicating those things of God and predicating those things of creation. Our position is that there's a similarity in meaning and that there's no similarity in ontology. You got it. This one coming in from NH Nurse says, Did Muhammad destroy Allah's idol with cabals? I don't know what that's talking about. Me neither. My Zabiba's trajectory says, If I text you the way, let's see. That's weird. MJ says, can Jay give an example of anything else that is counted differently as in the case of Trinity? We have three persons, one nature, but yet one God. I I don't understand. The question is, is there something that we, are there things that we count in different ways? Or can I give examples the way that we count God in different ways? Because... Uh, what I argued was that if you look at medieval philosophy, there's first order imposition, second order imposition. First order imposition is counting things that are mundane, like cows and dogs. Uh, and then second order imposition is counting abstract things like laws of logic or sets. And so, for example, um, concrete things we would count by division and abstract things we would count by identity. So even in the Middle Ages, people counted in different ways. So it's odd to me that the whole argument tonight was premised on we only count in one way, and that's counting by identity, which is why I said that if Jake counts by identity, then he has mis- many necessary beings uh, in his uh, account of the attributes. Got it. This one from the Chelskian says, when Allah comes down the third part of the night to answer prayers, that means that either Allah is like a yo-yo because earth is a globe, or that Muhammad thought that the earth was flat. I think this is for you, Jake. Uh, no, that's incorrect because, again, they're going into the kafia or the howness of the descent, which we don't. And we don't actually make the claim that it is a movement necessarily from one spatial location to the another in a similar manner that Jay Dyer believes that the attributes or energies descend upon creation. And he doesn't imagine that they're like ripping off a piece of and 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 somehow coming into creation and a landing on a human being so this is just a misunderstanding of our position you got it this one coming in from do appreciate it ahmed says jake alu akbar great job mj says can jay give an example of anything else that is counted differently as in the case of trinity we have three persons one nature but yet one god I think that's like the the last question. question, Yeah, that's the same question. Sorry about that. Matt Belcher says, Michael Lofton dressed as a Muslim. (laughs) I don't understand. This one from, who's your friend Michael? Okay, GPT.12 says, let's see. I don't think Michael Lofton has any friends on this stream. (laughs) This one coming in from, do appreciate it. Famo says, Jay, answer without, uh, they say, how can an unlimited infinite being, i.e. God, be finite, i.e. Jesus, and infinite, i.e. God, at the same time? Yeah, well, this is a, uh, what we talked about earlier with mode. And so the mode that Jesus entered into is a new mode of being, which uh, the book of Philippians describes as a willful non-exercising of every one of his attributes, I think that Jake himself has argued in the past that God doesn't have to exercise every power and every uh, attribute of creating at all times. And so in the same way, we just simply say that the second person of the Godhead uh, stepped into the mode of human nature while still having the divine nature. So he didn't lose his deity. He didn't uh, undergo any change. He didn't become the opposite of himself. We believe a both and rather than an either or. You got it. This one coming in from, just want to remind you folks, we are looking for sincere questions, not statements that... I don't know why these guys would pay a lot of money just to not get a question up there. It's just silly. I don't either. They're asking, they're saying all sorts of things. But this one from John, this one, we got this one, uh, Manib Zia 
says, Jay, how do you worship Jesus without worshiping his human nature? Don't you have to worship the created human nature when you worship the person of Jesus, which even Christians would consider idolatry? Well, this is addressed in St. Cyril and the Council of Ephesus because it's an argument that Nestorius makes. And um, interestingly, the Islamic uh, uh, or Oxford Handbook of Islam notes that there is, in fact, a Nestorian influence on Islam. So I don't fault him for making that uh, mistake or, or thinking that way. But the answer is just simply that Cyril says that <clears throat> we don't worship the creature uh, per creature. We direct all of our worship to the divine hypostasis. And uh, we give him a holistic worship as the whole being because it's the body of the word. We don't worship the body of Christ or the human nature of Christ in any divided or separate way, but we worship the God man who is also incarnate. You got it. This one, I'll read the appropriate part. They say, guys, it's read, go join GG slash Sunni. By the way, I'm six foot seven. Okay. Then, I have no idea what that means. I don't know either. The Sussif says discord.gg slash Sunni says join the debate review. So if yeah, we were happy to share about debate reviews, folks. If you want to go check that out, go have a conversation there. Uh Sussip says they say look at this. John Michael B says Jake says we are polytheist. Does he know we follow pagan? We got that one. Manib Zia says, Jay, got that. Abdishakur Nur says, Jay, how have you actually read Athari position? Because when Jake asked you simple questions, yes or no, you have hard time answering yes or no. Well, for example, when he asked about whether Al, Al, uh, uh, Ibn Tamiya believes in uh, occasionalism or secondary causes, I was trying to remember the specific page in the 400-page book, which I did read, which uh, says he doesn't believe in occasionalism. So I was trying to accurately give the position. Um, and so the answer is no, he doesn't believe in occasionalism. That's why I said specifically that he does allow for created causes. You got it. This one from Giant Meteor says, Jake, if... Alan's foot, I think they mean Allah's foot, and hands and other attributes, quote unquote, are not divisions of Allah, but each one is an identity. Is I think now there no, there it wasn't a mistake. They're saying Alan on purpose, I think. They say if Alan's foot and hands and other attributes are not divisions of Alan, but each one is an identity, is each one the whole of Alan? Yeah, so obviously he's talking about Allah. Uh, I don't know what's this Allen business, but we believe that the attributes, all of the attributes, and I repeat it again, we don't believe their body parts. So you can keep saying that we believe their body parts, but we don't believe that. And this is explicit in all of our texts. So it's just misrepresentation. But they are, we believe they're inseparable from the essence, right? Just as God's uh, power and knowledge, they're all inseparable from the essence. It's not like God's knowledge starts floating around and comes and drifts down to earth, and we don't believe that. So just a misunderstanding of the position. I'm Yulp says, Jake, I love you. Remember Jesus King and Joe, you're weird. And Derek, let's play Fortnite. Susup says, Justin in his dialogue makes it clear that the Father can't incarnate. This is clear subordinationism showing he believed the father had a level of greatness in his personhood where he can't incarnate. Do you pray to a heretic? Is that a question to me, I guess? I yeah. think so. I, I think don't pray to Justin. I know so you I don't pray to Justin. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it was, it was, it was phrased odd. Um, yeah. So like I said, I mean, the, the father, uh, the reason I said that we don't know is that I'm not aware of any statement where we're told, uh, by divine revelation that the father um, could not incarnate. Well, there are theophanic manifestations where we have the father, you know, speaking to the son, but that's an energetic manifestation. But like I said, Jesus says that, you know, no one sees the father at any time. So just like the divine essence is not perceived or seen, we don't think that the father is directly seen or perceived, except as Jesus says, uh, in the son. So I don't see why that's... Um, a problem really for our theology. I mean, it's not, 
if, if, if Justin Martyr makes a mistake like that, I would class it as the same type of mistake that Augustine makes. Can I just ask Jay a quick question about that? Are there disputes yeah. in orthodoxy uh, amongst the scholars about whether or not the father can become incarnate? No, I'm just I mean, a genuine it, question. I'm just asking. No, I'm just uh, was thinking about first divine revelation. I'm aware of what you're talking about in terms of what uh, John Damascus talks about. Um, but I was just trying to think about what they might be referring to, which is like we have stories or, or we have a case like where when Jesus is baptized, right, the father says, this is my beloved son. So somebody might think that that's the father entering into creation. But in our theology, we don't think the father enters into creation in that way, other than it's an energetic manifestation that tells us about the father, but it's not the person of the father. Okay. This one from Jack Hogg says, Allah is completely unlike created things, but yes, created things can predicate of Allah. Yeah, as I, I've explained numerous times, um, this hinges on our, and, and Jay is right to point out, I'm, I'm happy that we, that was actually part of the conversation, uh, nominalism, but they keep focusing on God, what the, but what these people don't understand, if they actually study nominalism, I believe that there is no shared reality between my hand and Jay's hand. I don't believe that there is this thing called handness, which is partially or fully identical in my hand and Jay's hand, or my knowledge and Jay's knowledge. Everything that exists is a particular. So there's nothing unique about this when it comes to Allah or uh, human beings. So people understand that this is a debatable point, but it seems like they're not even aware of uh, what nominalism even is. So from Beyond Doubt Theology says, Jay, you have a problem with God having a foot, but if you can say God died in parentheses Council of Ephesus, can't you say that God, or Jesus in particular, had feet? Yeah, so the internal critique was the first part about how when Jake gives an account or when Ibn Tamiya gives an account of the semantic content that's supposed to be similar uh, in terms of, quote, meaning, that actually ends up telling us nothing about what that actually is. That was the force of my argument in terms of an internal critique of his position. But it is true that um, in our theology, you could say that by appropriation or by what Cyril calls the communication, you know, communication of idiom modem or the communication of properties, that uh, God the Son died. It doesn't mean that he died in his divine nature or he underwent change or that the divinity became possible. It just simply means that the subject of the divine person of the Son experienced the severing of his human soul from his human body. You got it. This one coming in from Jack Hogg says, got that one. Imagination says, Jake, you cannot have your own definitions and tell Jay to respond by using them. It's utterly ridiculous. Allah means uh, fake by my definition. Could you please prove Allah is real? I mean, that's a strange uh, question there or statement. But, um, Obviously, my theory of language and theory of meaning is entirely different. I believe that the meaning of a word or a sentence or a phrase is based on the intention of the speaker. Okay, so when I ask about what power is or what, it, what this is, and then I explain my intention of what the meaning is, you can answer according to that and you can say, oh, but I don't use the word that way and, and give another answer. So there's no problem with that whatsoever. Well, except that you tried to say that I have to accept that meaning. <laughs> I mean, got it. Anyway. This one coming in from, appreciate it. Al Masihi says to Jake, Ibn Taymiyyah brings Sahi in his book that Muhammad sits with Allah where Arsh Kursi trembles. Since you pray to Allah, how are you not polytheist? Since I pray to Allah, how am I not a polytheist? I mean, <laughs> How is that even connected to the first part of what he said? I have no idea. And uh, since Jay is making comments on the backhand of my statements, then I would make a comment on the backhand of uh, his questions. And just as uh, the questioner was asking before about predications and the communication of idioms or attributes, likewise, Jay can appropriately say that God has a penis. There's no problem with that whatsoever. This one from I'm Yolp says, I was low-key having doubts. Then I remembered Jesus is God. Now I'm going to give doubts. Hi, Derek. I love you and uh, you as well, Joe. 
<laughs> Matt Schneider says, Jake, if you were on the North Pole and Jay was on the South Pole, could you both point toward Allah? Yes. We don't believe space is an actual thing. It's relative. But he believes that you can point up to Allah, and we believe that God is omnipresent. He's not in a spatial location. Up is a spatial location. This one from... depends what you mean by spatial location, but we can go back. Like and... up? No, like space. You do meaning, believe. You do space, believe. Up is space, so up is not a spatial location. Space, space in an Aristotelian sense of encompassing. In your sense, you you believe that you can point up to Allah. You said it to Khalil. I already I already just said that right here in my answer. Right, that's spatially direct. You don't think up is a spatial direction? Uh, we believe in a jiha or a direction, but when you use spatial, is that not spatial? When you use when you use spatial, it depends on what you mean by space. Yeah, so a new definition of space that's totally no. We we have an Aristotelian definition of space. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So this it's okay to use the medieval things here, but uh, what about counting has to be post frega? I never said that. What are you talking you about? I, my critique was that you're inconsistent in your counting method. That you don't have a. No, you you're inconsistent have, you because you count. You, you count have, the attributes by them. I already showed you that you looked like a fool because you I don't have. Count well, by so now you I have to go. Yeah, you have to go to ad hominem when I pin you down again. When you did what? When I pin you down, you have to go to ad hominem. You didn't pin me down. You, you just called me a fool. You. Because you, you are, count you, by you identity. You got I hate to do this. You count by identity. multiple necessary. Do count by identity. Awesome. So you have multiple necessary beings. No, we don't. We must move. They say, question for Jake. Please ask this, James. Uh, does Islam teach that Jesus is the nephew of Aaron and Moses? Sorry, say that again. They say, does Islam teach that Jesus is the nephew of Aaron and Moses? No. This one from Jim says, can Jake, quote in quotes, <laughs> tell us why Allah being called Quote, the one, the absolute, is not blatant mimicry of Pluton Plotinus, Quran oh, 112, 1 through 2. Thank you. Uh, we don't believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one or absolute in the way that Plotinus said. Plotinus believed in a complete, uh, in divine simplicity, in a radical sense. We don't believe in that whatsoever. So it's a complete uh, misunderstanding of our actual position. This one coming in from Sosa says, Jake, does Allah act in time or is he timeless? How does the doctrine affect immutability? The fal falsafa adhered to true Tawheed. Uh, if you mean by the philosophers Ibn Sina, we believe that he was a Kafir. Uh, so I'm sorry to tell you for, for, for the questioner. We don't believe he was a Muslim in that sense, unless you take the theory that he repented later in life. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I forgot what the first part of that question was besides the philosophers. So is is Allah act in time or is he time? Oh, yeah. And I'm surprised that Jay didn't actually, that I wish we would have had a chance to go through this um, more. Uh, if you mean by d does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala act in time, then yes, we believe that he acts in succession, that he has. And this was actually, and I, I mentioned this, uh, Jay and I don't agree on many things, but in my debate review of his debate with Asra Rashid, I think this is a serious problem that he highlighted uh, very effectively uh, in pointing out that the Ash'aris don't believe that the attributes of action are actually divine attributes. They say that Allah's actions simply refer to his created effects. We think this is complete nonsense. No, we believe that his actions are actual attributes or in the language of Eastern Orthodoxy, um, are energies, and they can have a beginning in time and yet are uncreated, and I gave support from that from Imam al-Bukhari in my opening presentation. This one from Alexander says, why does Allah have two right hands? Why does he have two right hands? I mean, it's just a, it's a silly question. If you actually read the text and understand why uh, the term right is used, right is used in terms of blessing. So we believe that the blessings pour forth uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. That's the, the meaning of the term, which I have uh, videos on uh, my channel explaining that. This is a standard tafsir or explanation of those uh, ahadith. I'm Yolp says, I'm currently twerking. Matt Belcher <laughs> says, Jake, if Allah is the only eternal, then why is the Quran also said to be eternal? Again, this is something I corrected Jay on. I'm surprised 
when he thought that I believe that the Quran is eternal. Uh, I didn't say you believe that. I just said I wasn't talking about that. Yes, you did. You did. No, I said I wasn't uh, talking you about can that. Go back, you can go back to the tape and look at it yourself. I said, I don't anyway, know what your position is there. I didn't say you believe okay. that. Okay, you don't know what my position is, what's explained in the text. We don't say that the Quran is eternal in terms of a speech act. We believe that it was spoken in time to the angel Jibreel, alayhi salam, and then to the prophet Muhammad, alayhi salatu salam. So we don't believe that it is eternal in that sense, only eternal in the sense of within God's knowledge that he knew what he would speak. But the act of speech itself happens at a particular moment in time. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate it. Sojourn on says, Jake, if Allah's hand is something that grabs, what is Allah's shin? God, this is just ridiculous questions. And anyway, 30 well, minutes. He, he thinks they're ridiculous because he don't want to deal with these. <laughs> No, I've I've answered. I, how many times have I answered questions about Allah's hand, Allah's foot? Every single time about because it, the these, meaning. It doesn't tell answered, us anything. It does. It does. I've explained no. the meaning several times over and over. Everybody and over. focuses on this because your explanations are terrible. That's why they focus on it, Jake. No, it's because you guys don't understand the basics of what I'm talking about when I say that it's a nominalist predication. I want to give Jake a chance that you to can answer. have. You can have a shared meaning, which I gave the meaning, and I said the meaning is known through the text, and I gave examples of that. And then Going you back, say, and I buried you on that. Yeah, and then you say that I nailed I you on that because of your no, you nominalism. Didn't, you didn't, you didn't nail me, but Jay, you don't even know the, the basic critiques is, of nominalism. I do know the basic critiques. No, you don't because you, don't, you said you they're don't particular. Know the basic critiques of your. So you own don't. Position. So you don't have logical laws. You don't. Know, you don't, you don't you have logical know. laws at all. Yes, I do this, but just to go back on track. Yeah, Jay can't control fire. himself. He has to interrupt it every moment. So no, turn on said, uh, Jake, if all his hand is something that grabs, what is all his shin? Yeah, I just I already responded to this question. <laughs> you got it. Moose, I responded to it five times already. <laughs> Moose says, Jay, do you support LGBTQ plus and you should believe in progressive Christianity? What? <laughs> I think this person's a troll, but I'll give you a chance. Uh, it's just the way they spelled progressive, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, Jay, um, do you support? Well, it was a statement that I should. Uh, or it's, what was it? A question? Do I? No, we don't. We think that's a sin. This one from Habakkuk Abu Muhammad says, okay, there's nothing, nothing about spanking. Uh, Giant Meteor says, Jake, you didn't answer my question. I didn't say that all his hands and foot are body parts. I ask if they are counted by division, but our identities are each one of them the whole of Allah. They're not counted by division. I already explained that they're inseparable and yet we count them. <laughs> they're inseparable and yet we count them as more than one. That means we are counting them by identity, which so I've explained. So multiple numerous necessary times. beings. Right. So multiple necessary beings. No, they're not most of the multiple necessary beings. I want to get are they are they, Jay, necessary? You, you are they necessary? You continually you continually can't control yourself. You have to answer. No, I just think on it's the funny. Backhand. I well, just no, I'm, I'm having fun. So then, so then, if I do that on every time you answer the question, it's okay, right? I don't care. Okay, well then, stick to the rules. We already established the rules, and you keep going off the rules. So which I do want to. I I I, I, thought, I mean, we're basically with you. Fun, right? I sympathize with you, Jay, because I know that there are way more questions for Jake, and it's. I, know I, I would like, yeah, but so many things Jay says. Don't you think I would love to respond? Oh, I know. Oh, don't God. worry. I'm being. Quiet. I'm getting there. What I was saying, I, I sympathize, uh, Jay. I understand I'm that. Just saying, it's we have to of... have consistent rules. Either Jay Jake, is going to abide by them, or you allow me to. Speak. Jake, I'm, I'm agreeing. I'm trying to basically give a like a rebuke to Jay right now. I'm just saying. Jay, I know that it's kind of boring when there are like a million questions for Jake, but to be fair, I, I mm -hmm. do want to keep it so okay. that we're not uh, having any sort of teaming up on Jake. This one from Cataclysm says to Jake, does Salafism hold normative authority to dogmatize and anathemize theology, i.e. Ashari occasionalism? Allah creates absolutely everything, making Allah the worst being. Would prayer under an Ashari imam be valid? Okay, so you're you're mixing two things. You're asking about prayer behind an Ashari imam, which is a question of fiqh, uh, not merely aqidah. And when you talk about the Ashari position on occasionalism, 
uh, we believe that they're completely wrong and that it's a deviant position because it goes against the clear text of the Quran and Sunnah, and it also goes against reason, uh, which again, and <laughs> I don't think Jay and I are very much friends here, but I have to point out that he uh, hammered Esra Rashid on the same point in the debate when uh, he, he made the point, which is a similar point that I would make, and which I don't know why they can't understand, that they make an all argument based on causation or causal chains to prove that God exists. And then when you get there, they say, oh, by the way, all of those uh, causal chains are not real. Uh, so it's, it's just a complete falsehood. This one from Prestaforo says, why did Muhammad get Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary, the sister of Moses, and Aaron confused? Say, repeat the question. Why did, See, why did Muhammad get Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary, the sister of Moses, and Aaron confused? I'm not aware of him getting them confused. I mean, you have to go into more detail about that. This one from Habakkuk Abu Muhammad says, A hundred dollars of Jake can name more than five books on Jake's position. Jake? They technically um, said Jack's position, which I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. My Italian uh, family still calls me Jack. They can't pronounce Jake for some reason. So this is what it is. But anyway, what's the question? What are we doing? They said $100 if Jay can name more than five books on Jack's position. Oh, so that's for Jay. That's for me. So I have, let's see, one, two, three, four. So I have four books here with me. So that would be the critique, critique of the Palmyrian Creed, which is not his position, but on his position. I have the Ibn Tamiyah book, Oneness of God. I have the Suleiman book, what we're talking about today with the quotes. So, and then I've got all of the Hanbali chapters in the Oxford Handbook. So I'm sure that doesn't meet the five criteria, but I don't think I need five, actually. Do, do we count the Quran too? <laughs> Does the Quran, so if, if I count the Quran, that's five. Does that, does that count? Lenlin said, is Jake open to having a debate with Sam Shamoon? No. Guy is out of his mind. You got it. Let's see this one from... Is this been 30? I thought it was 30 minutes of Q&A. Yeah, we're going on longer than that, but I'm just, uh, I'm being patient for James because I know that some of these are probably super chats, but we're eventually going to have to oh, wrap it up. I mean, that's fine. We are. Okay. We're at the three hour mark, so we're going to wrap it up. I want to say, folks, thank you for tuning in. Check out both Jake's and Jay's links in the description box. That includes, if you're listening to you, the podcast later, all of the debates end up on the podcast within about 24 hours of the debate being live. So if you're listening via spotify apple Podcasts, you name it both jay and jake are linked in the description box there check out their links now there's a value in getting to hear a person's point of view straight from them such as going to their own videos at their own channel so i highly encourage you folks check out their channels with that i want to say thank you so much it's been a true pleasure to have you both jay and jake thank you guys thank yeah, you. it was a lot of fun thank you my pleasure Folks, stick around. I'll be back in just a moment with a post credit scene letting you know about upcoming debates. So thanks for being with us, and I'll be back in just a moment. Thanks so much for coming by, folks. Thrilled to have you here and excited. I've got to tell you, right now, what I'm excited about, I'm going to show you a few things here. Because you might be thinking, like, huh, what are, you, what are you so excited about, James? Like, tell me. I have to know. Well, a couple of things. First is, here I am, bottom left. want to say thanks so much for being with us. If you have not already voted in that poll, it is still there waiting for you. 
in the live chat. You can do that right now. Want to encourage you as there's been about 3,500, 3,500, if I remember right, last time I checked, that many votes. Yeah, about that, 3,482, which is huge. Do want to encourage you to check that out. We are trying out some new things here at Modern Day Debate. As you see at the bottom right of your screen, let me just I'm gonna try to top left or top right. There we go. Cleaning that up a little bit. As you see at the bottom right of your screen is that some nights when we have a ton of questions and when we have limited time for the Q&A, we're going to do something where we're going to try to get to the standard questions still, namely those that you just tag me in chat with and then ask uh, the question. We're going to still try to get to those, but with limited time, we can't guarantee it. And then those nights, we're going to have $5 minimum super chat. So it's just a way of trying to keep the if we especially if you have two dollar super chats that are insulting people but we also don't want super chats that are frankly any amount that's insult people but we notice that you know not surprisingly a two dollar super chat you only need so many characters to type in you know so and so is a jerk uh so that's one thing is we want you could say more authentic questions but want to say we appreciate you being here with us i've got a lot of other things to mention in particular we actually have whew, this Tuesday, the MC Toon debate last Tuesday on Flat Earth actually got uh, nicked for the night. So I do want to let you know that is being rescheduled for this Tuesday. So that's one big one. And then the following Tuesday, Globy McGloby Face will be taking on a Flat Earther, a new one, in fact. So you don't want to miss out on those debates. If you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button as we have many more debates. But also, you might be thinking, like, James, uh, tell me uh, what else is going on. If you didn't notice on the screen before we started, is that right now, Modern Day Debate is also trying something else out. In particular, folks, as you can see at the bottom right of your screen, Visible Wireless is a sponsor for this debate. If you are paying more than you should for your mobile service, this is the time to switch over to Visible. And you're like, well, James, well, how much is too much? With Visible, you can get it for just $20 a month for unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data for just 20 bucks a month if you use the link in the description box below. Folks, what are you waiting for? Save your hard-earned money. Don't let it go for $35 a month for the same thing over at Mint Mobile. Save that $15 a month. Use it to go to Chipotle, use it to get yourself some coffee, whatever it is that you like to do instead of spending it on your mobile service. So that visible link, if you use our link below, I can tell you it is awesome. I use visible myself. I will never promote something unless I actually use it and I'm a fan of it. So I've got to tell you, I use it and it's amazing. I'm going to throw that link in the old live chat and I'm going to pin it and I'm going to wrap up that poll with 3,500 votes. That is huge. But I want to say we are excited about Visible being a sponsor for Modern Day Debate. And I just realized I don't think I have that link. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't even have that in the description box. So I'm going to grab that right now. And I want to say thank you guys for all of your support. Thanks for your patience. I was, uh, I was uh, slacking on that one. But I'm going to grab that link now. And I want to say, folks, the cool thing about Visible Wireless is you also have unlimited hotspot data. Now, the reason that's cool is because you could just cancel your internet at home. Because here's the thing. Why? Why have internet at home when you could just say, hey, uh, why don't I just use my hotspot on my phone? And then I can completely take out my internet bill. Let's say it's 60 bucks a month. And let's say you're paying 35 for mobile. So you could save 15 from your mobile bill. Plus, you could save 60 from no longer having Wi-Fi, that's $75 a month, which over the course of a year, that would be $900 of savings over the course of a year. So I gotta tell you, folks, check out that visible link right now. You won't regret it. You have the potential to save $900 over the course of a year. So I just put that link for the Modern Day Debate visible affiliate link. So for the first year, you get $20 a month. That's it. It's just 20 bucks a month. For unlimited talk, unlimited text, unlimited high-speed data, including unlimited, thanks Shane for sharing that in the old live chat, including unlimited hotspot data. So I, I, I'm just, for me, I got to tell you, I know everybody talks about 
hey, you know, things are getting really expensive. There are some things. It is true. There are some things that are more expensive. But mobile service is actually cheaper. Uh, for me, I remember when I first got on a plan with data independently. So like when I got off my parents' uh, cell service, Wi-Fi, or not Wi-Fi, uh, mobile service, is it was 25 bucks a month. And I got unlimited talk, unlimited text, and two gigs per month of high-speed data. That's it, just two. So in other words, like you'd blow through that. You could blow through that in like a few days. And then the rest of the month, you'd have just like super slow Wi-Fi, uh, or I should say super slow data for using your, your phone. But now uh, for 20 bucks a month, so cheaper, like you can get it compared to like six years ago. That actually, that wasn't six years ago. That was more like 10 years ago. Uh, for 10 years, compared to 10 years ago, you can get a better deal. Uh, and it's actually cheaper than what I was paying 10 years ago. So you can stick that in the face of inflation and tell them to, you know, stick that in their pipe and smoke it. Got to tell you, it's huge savings. I, uh, Anathema says I switched to Visible a few weeks ago and I am loving the savings. That's awesome. And I love it too. Actually, I use Visible. I don't get the same deal you do. Uh, now I am past that one year mark. I pay $25 a month. But even then, for me, I'm like, well, $25 a month is still better than when I was using Mint. It's better than when I was using Boost. It's better than when I was using, I think there was another one I tried, like Tether or something. I can't remember. Tello? I think it was Tello. But highly encourage you, check out Visible's link if you are looking for saving a few bucks each month on your mobile service. And potentially, like I said, you could use your phone as just a hotspot all the time. Like whenever you get home, just turn on the hotspot, connect your computer to it or whatever device you might be using, and you don't even have a Wi-Fi bill anymore. Amazing. So pretty cool. Got to tell you, I'm excited about that. I think it's a great deal. I want to encourage you to check that out. Thank you guys for your support. We're at 752 likes. Seriously, it means more than you know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some rest. It's been three hours, a little over. So thank you guys for coming by. I want to say hi to you, though, because I just I really do enjoy this. And I do just appreciate you being here. So Dead Alive Maniac, I see you there in the live chat. Thanks for being with us. Chica, is it Chicami? Let me know if it's pronounced that way. Glad to have you here. Sonia, thanks for coming by. I see you there in the old live chat. Sinclon, thanks for coming by. I see you there. Booty Killer, one, two, three. Thanks for dropping in. That's interesting. I am he. Thanks for coming in. Anathema, good to see you as usual. As well as NYC Tom08. Thanks for coming by. Norak, happy to have you here. It says, what? wow, how could they possibly do this? That's right. Visible is giving the deal of a, li a lifetime. And uh, you know what else is cheap? Netflix is cheap. But PHX576, thanks for coming by. And let's see, they say uh, modern day debate. Uh, I, my super chat was genuine, but you skipped it. I, I did mention earlier, if it wasn't a $5 super chat or higher, uh, it was both on screen and I did mention it verbally throughout the debate. So I've got to tell you, uh, you got to pay a little bit closer attention, man. Uh, Houston Euler, thanks for coming by. Happy to have you. Moss Calo, Calo, Calo. Thanks for coming by. Struggling Protestant, glad you're here. Sweet Bubbles, happy to have you here. Karzan, happy you're here. Gambit, glad to have you with us. Alonzo Harris, happy you're with us. Windfire, thanks for coming by. Manuel Palio, Palio Logos, thanks for coming by. Caribou, thanks for dropping in. Awesome, awesome clips. And Mr. Anderson, glad you're here. Abiel, thanks for coming by. Solid Ground, glad to have you here. A Catholic Dada. Am I saying it right? Glad that you are with us. J Samurai 79, thanks for dropping in. Karzan, happy to have you here. Baruch Adam, thanks for coming by. Chikami says, is Visible any good? Yes, Visible is good. It's actually, they use the satellites for Verizon. So you, you have good coverage. That's one thing I love too, is that like it's rare that I ever get to a spot where it's not good. So, Free Sean, thanks for coming by. See you there in the old live chat. Sim Claw, thanks for coming by. Troll says, your channel is growing. Nice to see. Thank you so much for your support. That means more than you know. Also, I have to tell you, I am so excited, you guys. Uh, thank you guys for making Modern Day Debate grow as you have. Uh, we owe it all to the debaters and to you. Thank you for sharing our debates, things like that. And thank you so much for just all of your support. Let's see. 
Vanatha says, good to have you back for this huge debate, brother. I replied to your email, was in hospital for a week. Wow, I hope you're doing okay. And man, glad to have you here, Shane. I'm glad you're are you're okay. If you know if you're here, we're we're glad you're you're here. So, but I'll get back to your email, and I appreciate you, appreciate you, man. Burika, thanks for thanks for coming by. Say there in the old live chat, and but yeah, I want to say you guys do appreciate you. Thanks so much. Dead alive maniacs is love the debates. Please step in more. Jake was kind of little okay. Let's see, Moel, thanks for coming by. So Fareed and Fareed, thanks for coming by. See you there. John V, glad to have you with us. Golden Victory Lighthouse, thanks for coming by. A debate already wrapped up, just so you know. Thanks so much. Davidson Trailer, happy to have you here. Houston Euler, good to have you. And I want to say, though, thank you guys for all your support. Hawaiian CC says Feet Picks. I'm working on it. Check your email. Thanks for coming by. I want to say I love you guys. Thanks for all your support. Join us while we were small. This is Modern Day Debates early stages. Believe me. Join us while we are young. Our story is just beginning. Modern Day Debate is going to do huge things in the coming years. And someday we're going to look back and say, wow, you remember when we were so small? We had 177,000 subs. That's how big we're going to be in the future. We're going to host bigger and badder debates, more epic debates, things that are going to knock your socks off. Believe me, they're going to be tremendous. People will be saying, wow, I can't believe Modern Day Debate, how they pull that out. That's amazing. We're excited. We are continually improving ourselves, complete, continually developing things, improving, tinkering, learning, and figuring out how we can improve more and more. I want to say thank you guys so much for all of your support. We're excited about the future as we strive to provide a neutral platform so that everybody can make their case on a level playing field. We believe that's important, and we know you believe that's important. We believe in letting a thousand flowers bloom, letting the chips fall where they may, giving people a chance to make their case on a level playing field. So I want to say thanks for all your support. I love you guys. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable, and we will see you at the next debate.